It is six o'clock and I call to order this meeting of the Kerrville City Council. I'd ask you at this time if you would stand for the invocation and followed by the <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance. Father, we have a lot of decisions to make tonight and I pray that we will do so fairly and with a clear sense of, of the nature of those decisions and that they make a positive difference in our community and for all the citizens. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have announcements of uh, community interest, and remember that uh, the purpose of this part of the agenda is for recognitions, reminders of events, as stated on the agenda under this item, and then also it's not a time to express opinions or positions on policy matters. Okay? Stuart? Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I want to say welcome to everybody. <coughs> uh, first meeting of 2019. I hope everybody is dealing with cedar fever. <laughs> I know it's kind of uh, causing some problems right now. We only have two announcements tonight. The first one is the Daddy and Daughter Sweetheart Dance. Uh, this is the city's 11th annual Daddy Daughter Sweetheart Dance. It's going to be held Saturday, February 16th at the Hill Country Youth Event Center. Um, tickets are on sale now, both at the Kerrville Parks and Recreation Department on Bandera Highway and also on the City of Kerrville's website. Now, all tickets must be purchased in advance. There's no ticket sales at the door. This event sells out fast. I think we had 500 attendees last year, which was double from the year before. Wow. So uh, we certainly expect to reach that number again this year. But that's a lot of fun. It's a fun event. We'll try and share some pictures from it uh, after it's over. And the other new announcement, you may have noticed the paneling, the new paneling along the wall. Uh, we have a new sound system uh, that we are in trying out tonight. We installed it this week. Uh, we have new speakers in the uh, chamber here, and tonight's the first night to try it out. Um, we have Frank, Frank Escamilla over here. Uh, he's our audio engineer, and he's going to be here with us to make sure that everything goes smoothly. His advice for speakers both up there and here is just to speak normally into the microphone. So hopefully we'll enjoy that, and everybody can hear what better. All right, thank you right. very much. Yeah, good. Um, we come to the Visitors a Citizens Forum. I had a couple of announcements. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, first one, I get in trouble if I don't announce. So my grandmother's 99th birthday is Friday. Oh. So uh, I just thought I'd throw that one out there. Um, and the other is uh, an announcement of a past event that um, I don't know who knew about it or heard about it, but uh, our own Vincent Vocal here did a pretty special Christmas Eve um free meal for the community. Um, it went off pretty well. It was uh, something that, as I understand it, he'd been trying to do for a while and then put it together with, I don't know his last name, Cole. Cole Brown. Cole Brown. He and Cole pretty much put it together and they ended up uh, with the help of some uh, free space donated by Buzzy at Buzzy's Barbecue. They put on a surprisingly busy event. Uh, it was uh, about 300 meals uh, served, and um, and I joined in making some pies, and uh, so it was it was pretty good. Hopefully, it's the first of uh, many future. So kind of make, make it traditional. Eve? Yeah, it turned out to be Christmas Eve. Yeah. For people who didn't have a place to go, or okay, that's, that's good. good. That's good. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, this is an opportunity for citizens to speak on any item not already listed on the agenda. Uh, no discussion will take place or action. Uh, since items are not posted, the council cannot respond to questions, but may refer questions to staff or place on a future agenda. Uh, individuals have four minutes to speak. Now, let me mention one other thing not directly related to the Visitors Citizens Forum. It has, decor, has to do with decorum here in the council chamber. At the last meeting, we had uh, a number of outcries uh, from the uh, citizens who were here. And uh, I should remind you, please, we're, we're not to have that. If they're disruptive or dis, disrespectful, uh, allowed comments made, uh, persons can be removed from the council chamber. But obviously, we want to avoid that. 
Okay, do we have anyone to speak at the Visitors uh, Citizens Forum? I do not have any. Okay. Yep. I was sitting on it. Okay, Mario Garcia. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Councilman. Um, I put my application, sorry, to be on the uh, Charter Review Committee, and I was uh, wanting to express that interest. Okay. I wanted to let you go ahead. I'm not sure you're in order because uh, that is an item uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda tonight, and you will have an opportunity, as I understand it, when we come to the consideration of that committee to, uh, to speak. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you, sir. I understand that we have a presentation tonight, and I'm going to call Chief Knight uh, for that purpose. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This, uh, this agenda item is for the presentation of the Certificate of Recognition for the Texas Police Chiefs Association. And here to present that is uh, Max Westbrook, Jr. Mr. Max Westbrook, Jr. is the Program Director for the Texas Police Chiefs Association Recognition Program. That's correct. Thank you, Chief Knight. I appreciate it. You know, I didn't have any cedar fever until I came out here and walked in the door and like five people talked to me, how are your cedar fever doing? I'm like, yeah. oh, <laughs> so I'm starting not to feel good. So I hope I can make through this. Mayor, council members, citizens of Kerrville, good evening. My name is Max Westbrook. I'm the uh, director of the recognition program for the Texas Police Chiefs Association and a member of the Texas Police Chiefs Association. I'm honored this evening to be representing the TPCA in the Best Practices Program. The Texas Police Chiefs Association is made up of over 1,100 professional police chiefs throughout the state who are dedicated to improving the delivery and quality of police services. I'm here this evening to present the Kerrville Police Department with a certificate of re-recognition for continuing to maintain their compliance with Texas law enforcement's best business practices for law enforcement for the past four years. Several years ago, the Texas Police Chiefs Association developed an accreditation program for Texas law enforcement agencies. Many of you know about accreditation programs for schools, universities, and hospitals. They are all programs of professional excellence and all require proof of compliance with a set of professional standards. Ours is very similar. It is a voluntary program and agencies must meet 168 very difficult standards. The standards are based on Texas law, Texas court decisions, and contemporary best practices standards as identified by the Texas Police Chiefs Association. These standards address the full range of law enforcement operations such as the use of force, protection of citizens' rights, vehicle pursuits, property and evidence management, and patrol and investigation operations, just to name a few. Approximately eight years ago, the Kerbal Police Department was among the first in the state to become a recognized agency, and it was not easy to do. The agency had to conduct a complete audit of its policies, procedures, and operations in order to meet these standards. Since that time, the agency has submitted annual reports that were reviewed to ensure they continue to meet standards and continue to provide the citizens of Kerrville with effective police service. In November of last year, two trained assessors, police chiefs and command officers from <coughs> other state agencies, spent two days making another on-site ass assessment of the Kerrville Police Department. These assessors interviewed staff, inspected facilities and operations, they rode with field officers, and they ensured compliance with all 168 standards. Their report was then sent to the Recognition Committee, committee which is comprised of nine active police chiefs from around the state of Texas. The committee voted to award recognized status to Kerrville, and that vote was unanimous. During this process, the Kerrville Police Department has once again proven that it meets or exceeds the best practices standards for professional law enforcement services in the state of Texas. Of the only, this is my favorite part of this right here, of the over 2,400 law enforcement agencies in the state of Texas, only 150 have achieved recognized status. Only 72 have been re-recognized. This evening, we officially recognize the Kerbal Police Department for their outstanding performance. What does this mean for your community? The recognition program assures that both city management and the citizens of Kerrville and the police, that their police department is operating in a manner that reflects best business practices in the state of Texas. It means your police department is continually striving for professional excellence. 
It means your police department is one of the very best in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. This certificate we present this evening is symbolic. While it is clearly the mark of professional excellence, the real value in the program is the process they must complete to receive the certificate. And once again, this is not the end of the process. The department will continue to submit annual reports to ensure compliance, and in four years, we will be back. It was my honor to do this exact same speech four years ago in this chamber. The Kerbal Police Department is a leader in law enforcement, and you should be very proud of their accomplishments. Chief Knight, would you please come forward? You're behind me. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why we wear dark uniforms. <laughs> Uh, the Texas Police Chiefs Association Foundation, to all those who see this certificate, the Kerrville Police Department, having fulfilled the necessary qualifications and mandatory requirements of the Texas Police Chiefs Association, Texas Law Enforcement Best Practices Recognition Program, by voluntarily proving their compliance with Texas Law Enforcement Best Practices, the Texas Police Chiefs Association Foundation Board of Directors does hereby award this certificate of recognition. Congratulations, Chief. Chief, would you introduce in a minute uh, Officer Krebs and the other officers that are with you? Absolutely. <laughs> this is Lieutenant Mary Krebs. She's our support services lieutenant, but she is also our program manager for the department. She's done a fantastic job uh, over the last eight years of being a program manager. And she does phenomenal work. Lieutenant Phil Lindstrom, who's the investigations lieutenant for the department, he also does phenomenal work, and he's also been involved in the recognition program, as everybody has. Lieutenant Phil Lindstrom, or uh, John Klein, <laughs> the uniform threw me off. Our patrol lieutenant for field operations, he's in charge of all field operations, and, uh, and they're intimately involved in this entire process. And Assistant Chief Curtis Thomason, who also was the program manager, so he knows uh, the challenges that we've all faced for the last you know, eight years uh, getting ready to come up for re-recognition. Thank you all. Hey, this, this represents real professionalism in our <clears throat> police force here, and they are greatly appreciated. And Mr. Westbrook? Yes, sir. You probably will not be here, but later in regard to the Cedar Fever, later in this council meeting, I'm going to introduce an ordinance outlawing cedar pollen from December through early March. Yeah, okay, all right. Now I come to the uh, consent agenda that uh, will be, these items will be considered together and voted on together unless a council member wants to pull one. I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda items that are in the consent agenda. All right. Okay. I second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor with the raised hand. Okay. All right. Um, the At this time, um, one of our council members could not be here for a 530 meeting, and so we need to go into an executive session. We hope about 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, I would like a motion in that regard, and or I, uh, and if you will also note under the state law what sections we're observing. I'll make a motion under uh, that we go into executive session under five five one zero eight seven business Pro prospect economic development. Yeah, and section five five one. I said that already, right? Okay. Five five one zero eight seven. Yeah. Okay. And and oh seven one. All right. Uh, I second. Okay, if there's a second, all in favor, if you'd raise a hand. Okay. Like I say, 20 to 30 minutes. Enjoy getting to know each other and uh, so forth, and then we'll be, we'll be back. Just leave it up. Uh,
We are back in order at uh, 6.43, and we're going to move to uh, item 7D. And Ms. Brown, if you would read that for us. Resolution number 01-2019, establishing the city's support of legislation during the 86th session of the Texas Legislature to finance a hotel conference center. All right, and I'm going to ask the city manager to respond to that. Thank you, Mayor. So this is a really pursuit of a program that the state has uh, under Section 351 of the tax code that 39 other Texas cities have taken advantage of, and it's a rebate of the hotel tax off a new project that, that would have otherwise gone to the state. So the, the city collects 13% hotel tax, 7% goes to the city, and 6% goes to the state. This would be a rebate of that 6% back to the city for up to 10 years to help pay for uh, the, the funding necessary for a public-private partnership for a new conference center hotel. Um, this um, local support uh, needs to be in place for this bill, so that's why we're asking you all to consider this resolution. I'll be in front of the commissioner's court on Thursday to ask for their support as well. Um, and then I'll also be talking to the CVB and others to, to basically answer questions and ask for their support. So you'll recall that the city actually commissioned a study back in 2018 that uh, did some research into what we could support here locally in terms of a full-service hotel and conference center, the number of rooms, the square feet of meeting space, uh, what would be the long-term um, market uh, demand for, for such a facility, what are the other competitors um, that are in the region, and how would we compete, what would be the average daily room rate, the impact to the local economy, uh, and so forth. And so since then, we have been pursuing a funding package, if you will, on how we're going to get to that public-private partnership. So this is, this is a tax that's already being collected by the state. It just means that uh, it's not a new tax. We would just be getting that uh, back from the state on a rebate basis over a period of time. Um, so the study also determined that there's a large amount of meeting and lodging demand uh, for our market that's not being captured. So this is business that we're not getting today that would be coming to this new hotel. Um, this is economic development in a real sense. It's importing dollars into our community from elsewhere with new, uh, not just new, new dollars, but also jobs coming into our community. Um, and again, this would be money that would otherwise just be going to the state on a new project. So. Tonight, we're asking for you all to, to adopt this resolution so that we can then carry that to our state rep and our uh, senator uh, who have agreed to sponsor a bill for us. Uh, so at this point, I would take any questions from the council. Okay. We have questions from the council. Mark, I think it, it's important for people to understand there has been nothing put on paper that says we, it would be a hotel that would hold 10,000 or 1,000 size location there's nothing in place like that that is all yet to come it, it is to a large degree the study did um, give some parameters about how many rooms it, it should be and how many, many square feet of meeting space based upon all their research and surveying that they did um, but the exact number um, and and how how much it's going to cost where it's going to go all of that is really um, to be decided yeah, to be at a future decided. date because we don't have a partner yet, a developer. Uh, they may have some ideas of their own about where they would like it and uh, and what need to be included in the facility because they've, they've got to make it work financially uh, so they'd be on the hook for the hotel and, and then operation of the of our conference center. Okay, but to, just to be clear so that everybody out in the world knows we didn't just vote to create a convention center. We're, we're just <laughs> saying that if we decide to create a convention center at some later date, we're setting up a piece of the funding source for that cur that public aspect of the creation. Because right. if we don't say that clearly, it's going to get reported that we just voted to do a convention center tonight, which we're not doing right now. Well, as you said, this would just be one component of the right. public <laughs> investment to make this work, because right. it would be a publicly owned conference center and probably a privately owned hotel right. on city property. So, you know, all that, the details have to be worked out, but this is just one piece of that stack that would be required for uh, public financing. 
and you're and we'll be talking to the county just to to get their consensus. We'll be asking for the same resolution. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Do we have uh, questions or comments from the audience? I have a, a speaker request from Charlie McElvain. Okay, Charlie. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, certainly, Kerrville needs additional product, and this is one form of, of assisting in moving that forward. The Convention and Visitors Bureau is uh, totally supportive of this resolution. All right, thank you. Charlie McElvain is director of the Convention Visitors Bureau. Brian? I don't have any other speaker request for Okay. I'm going to ask for a motion on uh, this item, 7D. I, I move that we we uh, approve resolution 01-2019. Okay. Mr. Broody? All right, here you go. Second? I'll second. Okay, Ms. Eichner? Second. All in favor, let it be known by the raised hand. It passes unanimously. Okay, we... Uh, now go into a public hearing. Uh, anyone may speak on public hearing items. They do not have to sign in, but if they do, that's okay. You'll be limited to four minutes. And when you come to the podium, uh, be sure to state your name and street address uh, for the record. And it is uh, 649. Okay. Mr. Paxton? I'm sorry. Ms. Brown, would you read that in? Ordinance number 2019-02, amending the city's zoning code by changing the zoning district for an approximate 6.790 acres consisting of lots 1 and 2, HEB edition, and portions of lot 300-302 and lots 348 through 349, block 48 of the Shriner 2nd edition, both subdivisions within the city of Kerrville, Kerr County, Texas, and more commonly known as the property located at 300 Main Street, State Highway 27, by removing the property from 11-C Zoning District and placing it within, within by removing, with, I'm sorry, within the Central Business Zoning District, the CBD containing a cumulative clause, containing a savings and severability clause, providing for a maximum penalty or fine of $2,000, ordering publication and providing other matters relating to the subject. All right, Mr. Paxton. Thank you, Mayor. This is a request from HEB to extend the CBD zoning onto the entirety of their property. Their current property is split between the 11C and the CBD Central Business District. The request is consistent with the comprehensive plan as there should be a strong focus on redevelopment and catalyzing renewed public interest in the area within the catalyst area number one, which is downtown. Planning Commission recommended this case for your approval, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Okay. Um, anyone would like to speak for or against this matter of zoning? I have one speaker request form from Lawrence Walker. Okay. My name is Lawrence Walker. I live at uh, 406 West Water Street in a house that happens to have been in my family since the mid-1950s. I walk to HEB. Uh, I love where it is. I am uh, not here tonight. The good news is I'm not here to talk about cedar trees. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here to talk about oak trees. As you look from the parking lot of the current HEB into the houses and the lots that this ordinance concerns, there are some gorgeous legacy oaks. I hope that both HEB and the city of Kerrville will respect and protect some of those largest oak trees as the design of the store may or may not occur, whether or not this ordinance is passed. But if it is passed, I hope that the city will, will promote with the company uh, the protection of some of those gorgeous trees. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Lawrence. I don't have any other speaker request forms. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to gavel the uh, public hearing closed and uh, ask the council if they have any questions, beginning with place one. Uh, no, on this item. I'll speak on the next one. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. I think it's exciting yeah. to mm -hmm. hear about this. All right. Okay. Do we have a motion in this regard? I'd make a motion that we pass Ordinance 2019-02. Okay. 
All right, Mr. On Brady, first read. Do I, have, yeah. do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay, <laughs> second, Mr. Vocal. All right. Uh, all in favor of this, if you let me know by the raised hand. Okay. And we gavel out of that uh, public hearing and into another one at 653. And if you'll read that for us, Ms. Brown. Ordinance number 2019-03, abandoning, vacating, and closing two public rights of way consisting of a portion of Hay Street as it extends between the northwest right of way of Main Street, State Highway 27, and the southwest right of way of Jefferson Street and consisting of approximately 0 0.5792 acres and a portion of the 16-foot public alley located between Hay Street and Quinlan Street. Addition, adjacent to lots one and two, block two of the HEB addition, between lots 315, 316, and the northwest 43 feet of lot 333, and the southwest 13 feet of lot 334, block 50, and consisting of approximately 0 0.726 acres, Said rights of way are out of the Charles Schreiner second <coughs> edition to the city of Kerrville, a subdivision of Kerr County, Texas, according to the plat recorded in volume K, pages 107 of the deed records of Kerr County, Texas, making a finding that neither the street nor the alley is required for present or future public use, providing for the terms and conditions of abandonment, vacation, and closure providing for the furnishing of a certified copy of this ordinance for recording in the official public records of Kerr County, Texas, as a quit claim deed authorizing the city manager to take all necessary action to effectuate the abandonment, vacation, closure, and quit claim, and providing for a public hearing. All right. Mr. Paxton. Thank you, Mayor. This is a Kerrville 2050 comprehensive plan item as it helps the city and opportunities for existing local business to expand their operations in order to achieve the overall goal of balancing, broadening, and diversifying the city's tax base and to help to shift the tax burden away from residential property owners. Kerrville 2050 plan also promotes the revitalization and reinvestment of downtown. HEB has requested the closure of Hay Street between Main Street and Jefferson to accommodate the relocating of their store adjacent to the current store. The street closure ties the CBD district with the HEB's future plan for the redevelopment of this site <clears throat> as located in the strategic catalyst area number one. And we please to answer any questions All right. before or after the public hearing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Paxson will be available to uh, answer questions. Uh, do we have speakers? I have one speaker request for him from Bunny Bond. Okay. okay. <coughs> My name is Bunny Bond. I live at 213 Stephanie Street in Kerrville. I'm speaking in opposition to the closure of the 300 block of Hay Street. This is not the first time this request from HEB has come before the Kerrville City Council. The Kerrville City Council refused the request back in the 1990s, and I spoke in opposition to the closure of Hay Street at that time. Hay Street is eight blocks long. It begins at Water, crosses Main Street, crosses Jefferson, crosses Shriner and continues north across McFarland, Barnett, East Davis, Pearl, and Miller. At the north end of Hay Street is the only homeless shelter in the city of Kerrville and in Kerr County. Salvation Army makes it possible for people to lodge there from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. with dinner and breakfast served. Closure of the 300 block of Hay Street blocks direct access from the state highway to the shelter. There is a traffic line at the corner of Hayes and Main, and many people use that 300 block of Hay Street to cut across to the major east-west streets west of Cindy Baker. The traffic study in the 1980s by Texas A&M cited that Kerrville lacked east-west access streets, and it is not in the best interest of traffic to block access to those east-west arteries in the central business district. HEB is not making use of the traffic light at Hayes in Maine, 
as access to the parking lot for the grocery store. Many people use that light for access to the current parking lot. As I stated before the Planning and Zoning Commission, HEB could flip the gas pumps to the east side of Hay Street and place the store at the west end of the lot. That would allow 300 block of Hay Street to remain open. A larger store means more traffic. I've not counted the number of parking spaces on the diagram, but the projected size of the store would seem to mean an increase in traffic hazards. HEB needs to make use of that lot light for traffic access to their parking lot. I question whether Textron has been consulted about the closure of um, Hay Street as Main Street is the state highway. I question whether the fire department and the police department have been consulted for an opinion as to their access to the businesses and neighborhoods served by Hay Street. I question whether a complete plot of the entirety of the Hay Street area has been presented to the city council for analysis before making a decision. As the closure of the 300 block of Hay Street affects the residential neighborhood, local businesses, traffic access, and emergency vehicle access. I've not seen any mention of a reference to permission from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, often referred to as TCEQ, and the increased number of pumps that HEB is planning. I want to express my concern about the location of the number of pumps on the west end of the HEB property and the proximity to town <coughs> and the Guadalupe River. I respectfully request that the City Council table this request and ask staff to complete further investigation and report back so that the City Council is able to deliberate this street closure with more information. I do not believe that this request is in keeping with the intent of the Kerrville 2050 plan and the welfare of the citizens of Kerrville. I ask that each member of the City Council drive the length of Hay Street and ponder this decision for the future of this area and the city. If the City Council moves forward with this request tonight, I'm asking that the City Council members vote against the closure of the 300 block of Hay Street. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Paxton if you would, uh, can you address any of those concerns that have been expressed? Mr. Mayor, if I could, do we have the project engineer with the uh, applicant here today? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm with uh, Stantec uh, Consulting Services in San Antonio. Um, in regards to the concerns, uh, we also have our traffic engineer that can address uh, some of the traffic questions. Um, in regards to TCEQ permitting, uh, all of HEB's fuel stations are permitted through the TCEQ. We register the tanks with TCEQ. We follow state regulations. We follow local regulations as any of the fuel stations that HEB has built in the past. Um, have, we've always followed regulations in that regard. Um, as far as flipping the store and locating the store on the north end facing the other direction, um, we've looked at that. That's uh, been comp uh, considered over the years, and really this is what we've, uh, we've come to the conclusion that this is the best orientation uh, that, that works for the <coughs> property, the surroundings, the, what property that uh, HEB can acquire, uh, and to be able to <coughs> build a store while the existing store stays in operation. Um, so. I think I hit most of the points. Um, were there other questions that I could answer? Yeah, uh, so any, any in regard to fire and police issues in terms of the closing of the street? You want to address the traffic? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Howdy, my name is Bob Ecturani. I'm with Bo Consulting, traffic engineers. We're at Austin, Texas. Um, I'm not specifically aware what conversations have been had with uh, fire and EMS on the closure of the roadway. However, from a traffic perspective, we have sat down with TxDOT. We are in constant communication with them on, on our proposal. Uh, we are currently going through a traffic analysis that we're working with the city and TxDOT on. Part one of that study has, has been submitted, and we're now transitioning over to part two of that study, and we're actively working with the city and TxDOT to get those uh, processed and uh, the goal being approved. And I would add that we have talked to the fire chief and the police chief, and that is not a concern. All right. Okay. Can you elaborate a little bit on what 
what you said approved. Is there is there some question to text dot that you need to get approved, or what what are we talking about? No, uh, so I, I approach traffic studies a little differently than other consultants do. Um, typically, historically, what what a consultant would do is is do a full boat TIA and submit it. Uh, TIAs are actually two parts. The first part is where are cars going to and coming from. The second part would be the analysis of those cars and how the how the network is performing. Um, we have seen historically by doing one full boat TIA, if the part one portion of the study, where cars are coming from and going to, uh, if the agencies, the reviewers don't agree with that, we've just wasted a lot of time and money doing the second part when they can't even review it because they don't approve the first part. So we split it up into two parts to simplify it, especially as this is a little bit more complex with the fact that we're closing down a roadway and we're making uh, professional uh, estimations on where cars are going to then redistribute through the roadway network. And so that was my goal and what, what I proposed to the agencies and they text out and city agreed to go through that methodology. And so the part one portion was submitted and I got my, the blessings from text out on that. And now we're moving forward with the actual operational analysis to understand how are, how are the intersections going to perform and what, if any, mitigation <coughs> measures are going to be needed. Okay, so that's kind of, I think, what her point would be, which is, we're sitting here, we're going to close the street before we know whether we've got the ability to mitigate those features. Is that not what you just said? We know. We know what we're, what we're planning on doing. We've had conversations with city staff, and I, I think they might be able to elaborate a little bit more on, on their position on what we've presented to them. But we feel confident in the solutions that we've, uh, preliminary solutions that we've provided them uh, for how it's going to be mitigated. All right. Uh, do we have other speakers? I don't have any other speaker forms. Okay, all right. Uh, if that's the case, then we are ready to uh, come to a vote. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I happened to be at the PNZ meeting last, whenever it was last, and the HEB rep was there, and I know we, we looked at the site plan, and I started considering what you were suggesting regarding moving over to the east side, and according to her um, research, a two-year research, it, it won't work to put a bigger building on the site if you don't have that street and part of that real estate to work with. And there's no point to doing a new building if you're not going to increase it and improve it and, and do the bells and whistles that <clears throat> we've all been waiting for. So I, I think, you know, you make a good point, but I think the real estate just isn't, it's not situated to, to have that building. Um, we're available if you, okay. if you have any oh, questions directly. representative that spoke. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, Kathy right. Scribble, I think. Kathy, would you speak, please? And the other thing I wanted to say, which is somewhat separate, I would like to see if we could somehow protect those heritage oaks or the legacy oaks, uh, wherever the gentleman is. So I just want to make a point in a minute. Maybe there's some way we could just, HEB can consider that when you're building this new project. Mm -hmm. Let me, two, two points, sorry. <laughs> Okay, if you'll speak a little louder. Yes, sir. Is that better? Okay. Um, Kathy Strimple with HEB 646 South Florida. Let me address the first question, which was the orientation of the store. You're, you're correct. We're, we are <coughs> wanting to make an investment in the community to, to build a bigger, a bigger box that will hold all of our new innovations that we've not been able to bring to the community in Kerrville. And to do that, it doesn't physically fit on the property facing the other direction. We have looked at it for years, trying to, um, Not have to work the within street. the property that we had access to. And it, and it, physically, it's not feasible to make it work facing the other direction. Um, with regard to the tree preservation question, we are trying to save the trees that are along Jefferson. The orientation and the location of the store sitting um, to the right of the existing store on the property that we've just requested zoning, the new store will cross over into the um, proposed abandonment of the Hayes Street will be kind of the front of the new store. Um, so there are some trees that are within the building footprint that right. are, are infeasible to save. The ones around the perimeter, we are looking to try to save some of those larger ones. Okay. Right. Did I miss anything? Okay. okay. Anything to add? No, Benjamin Scott with HEB also. We're just available for any comments and questions. Um, we understand the sensitivity about the road closure. 
And uh, we have, as Kathy said, and everyone else made every effort to figure it out. But uh, at the end of the day, we couldn't fit a larger store on the existing. And what we think is this impact is, yes, it is a street closure. But it, compared to some of the options we looked at through the years, this is less impactful to the neighborhood of taking out multiple residential lots to create the ability to keep a store at this location. Um, so without the street closure of Hayes, we, we've left with options of either encroaching further into the neighborhood or moving the store further out of town. Um, so we were hoping this, this and staff has worked very closely with us on what we think is a good solution um, for everyone. And we're very excited about the possibility of keeping the store at its current location. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the council, starting with place one. Uh, yes, please, staff. Um, Ruth, uh, what utilities do we have in the ground, and, and what's going to happen with drainage when we close that, or if we close that street? There's a, excuse me, there's a water sub that actually feeds HEV, so that will be relocated with the new construction. Uh, as far as drainage, uh, to my knowledge, that study has not been completed, but it will be accounted for. Is there any underground stormwater drainage there, or is it all on the road? It's all yeah, I'll comment on that real quickly. The, the, there is uh, underground stormwater drainage that is at the intersection of 27 and Hayes. Uh, and there, as you know, there are some regional drainage issues on Hayes Street. And so uh, the solution that has been provided by HB actually provides for the rerouting of that drainage and helping the city and the community solve that regional drainage issue and getting that both around their facility, better access from Jefferson, uh, 227. So the, it helps us in that front. There's only water, there's no sewer. Correct. Um, and also, this is just, I guess I'm just curious about it. Who owns the street? Because I kind of asked Hayes about this earlier. If the property abutting the, they're joining the road, they're paying taxes on what's deeded to them, but we don't own the street. So is no one paying taxes on the street? That's correct. It, it How does that? happen That's, so they own the center of the road okay so we're just abandoning a right away we're not conveying any land that's correct okay. all right great uh two yeah my, my question is kind of this bond kind of stole what i was asking but but basically my concern is really i think everybody agrees you know heb great company and great community um service iconic and all that um so i don't want this to be perceived as something against the project but the my concern is really about the is about the traffic flow um hayes as she, as she described hayes is actually a a very main north south road that we use we got the light not just at maine but we got the light at shriner and when we talked about um the danger zones that we have um along Shriner Street, one of them was Clay, Clay and Shriner, and another one is Francisco Limos and Shriner, <clears throat> which both will now get more use at them and um, because nobody's gonna cut from Main Street through now, we're gonna go to Francisco Limos. And if you've ever tried to make that mm -hmm. left at Francisco Limos, it's that's gonna need a light. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're talking about. So when we're, when we're talking about this closure and this particular ordinance is talking about a cost. Um, I would like to see us view the cost to the city of giving up this road um, involve those, those mitigating factors that we are going to need because we're still going to have to deal with clay. We'd already talked about it before using something, a light, a, a traffic circle. One option was actually forcing people, instead of being able to make a left on clay, you were going to have to go down to Quinlan or Hayes, so now that option's gone. So you see what I'm saying? We, I think we should be maybe valuing this giving up the right-of-way a little bit more is all. I mean, has anybody looked at that, what's going to occur in the overflow? As far as the additional cost of a new light? Well, no, I mean, he, he talked about, I forget where we went, but he was talking about the traffic studies. I would assume that mitigating the traffic flow that's now going to sit at those two points would come out of that study, and I'm guessing there's going to be a cost to somebody at that point. Uh, okay. 
HEB is compensating us for the street, correct? For the right of way, yes. And then there are, is, uh, as, as the city does the drainage work that's required, that will also be factored in? Mm -hmm. Okay. They'll be doing the drainage as part of their project, and that's why they're getting credit for it up front. Okay. So they're getting credit for doing the drainage necessary, and they're going to compensate the city for the street. Okay. Uh, my question is, if you were to take a, a, a visual of this because of where the gas station will be located, it's going to look a lot like the HEB in Bernie. Would that be a correct assessment? No? I'm, I'm thinking in my head, honestly. <laughs> I'm the, the store orientation and the fuel station are a little bit diff different in Bernie. The fuel station sits okay. more along the side. Along the side of the, of the street, okay. This will be at the very end of the parking lot, which okay. is a lot more traditionally like uh, how we like to do it because it helps separate the circulation around fuel okay. people that are just doing fuel and people that are shopping. Um, one of the other aspects that we like about this layout is one, you get a clean parking field compared to what you all uh. are dealing with today where it's all in front of the store, traffic's a little more continuous, and we are all also working on putting a dedicated traffic signal for that entrance to the store for, to help with those safety concerns as well. So we, we do believe in the long run that this will be a, a lot safer, more convenient parking lot with a lot more options for people to get in and out safely, be it to the light at Lemos or the new traffic signal here and, and multiple options to be a safer, safer parking lot in the long run. About how many additional parking spaces will this produce? It, it's significant. We're getting to kind of, uh, based on store square footage, we're trying to target kind of the one parking spot per 175 square feet of the store. I think right now we're nowhere close to that uh, with okay. what we do. And I would say we're really underparked in the way that a lot is along the side of the store. There's a lot of cross Hayes Street today that is segregated. This is one uniform, uniform, safe parking lot where folks don't kind of have to migrate all over. I think there's a lot of cross traffic between cars going different ways, carts going different ways today that, that will be a lot uh, better in the new situation. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Two, I, I'm sorry. I just got an answer quick. 200 more parking spaces in the new ah, So okay. a significant increase. Yes. This may not be the right time to ask, but I'm curious about the gas pumps. The site plan looks like there's not a lot of room on the west side. I don't know how much room there is, but so will the traffic flow only one way, or will there be you know a, a direction, a guiding map of some sort, arrows, blinking lights, do not enter, whatever. <laughs> I understand your question. Let, let me um, say a couple things. Um, if you compare what we're proposing to what you're what you're seeing out at Bernie, it's in a different location on the site. It's further away from the front door, which is something that we, we do strive to do. But it also has circulation just around the fuel station. So they're, they're laid out. It's roughly about 30 foot. If there's a 30 foot drive on all four sides of the fuel station, plus or minus, which is enough for two-way traffic that circulates around the fuel station, not getting into the main driveway that's going north-south. Right. I see that one driveway. So as opposed yeah. to what, you, what we have out there today, to get to the fuel station, and our fuel station and our parking lot traffic are using the same drive aisle. Right. So here, we've been able to move it. It's got its own space, and you can get in and out a lot safer, and you can still navigate around the parking lot and do your shop without getting um, mixed up in the fuel station traffic. And are y'all going to block that alley off? Since it can't be widened, and the alley that goes to Francisco Lemos, or will that have it, will that be an access? It is a public alley, so okay, it's, so it'll remain. It's not, we are working with city staff to figure out what to do with it. We we would like to make some improvements to it so that it is safer to use, mm -hmm. um, because we're not closing it, so it is there. So we're still working with staff to figure out what we can do with that alley. It is 15 or 16 feet wide, so it's mm -hmm. not wide enough for two-way traffic, but we are looking at some options. I use it, but okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, Thank you. If there are none other questions from council, uh, do I hear a motion on this item? I would like to move that we approve ordinance number 2019-03 
abandoning and vacating and closing two public rights away, um, consisting of uh, Hayes and uh, Main Street. Right. Yeah. Can I ask a question, sir, real quick? I, have you signed up to speak to I this? I signed line? up, but I didn't put down this one here. But I can write and put it down. Okay, sign up. No, wait, wait. Sign up and then speak. I did. Just did. Put my name. Okay. Is it is it for this item? Oh. No, it's for <laughs> visitors, and then we moved it over towards the. Uh, uh, appointments. The, uh, appointments. Let him speak, and yesterday. he'll sign up later. All right, go ahead. What's that? Go ahead and speak, and just make sure you turn one in. My question is, just really curious. I see the trend of shopping, and I don't see that we need these huge stores anymore. I've noticed, and it's funny, I told my wife like 10 years ago that I have a feeling that these box, huge box stores are getting smaller. And I started seeing in San Antonio that there's small Walmarts everywhere in these small communities. And I'm really curious if you guys have studied where your shopping actually going to go, because I actually see... This huge store here, and probably 10 years from now, everything's being shipped, and we won't be needing the parking space. Make y'all consider that? I think that's very good. Yeah, I'm just curious if y'all looked into that. That's, that's what my question was. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right. Would you like me to address that, or? Actually, yeah. Just show us where on the site plan where the pickup is going to be. That's oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it will be right, right up to that. The plan is right now on the front um, oh, okay. for curbside pickup, and that is part that's integrated into the store. Okay. We're definitely embracing that as a future trend yeah. there. Um, but we don't see that store size going away. Uh, Walmart opened a bunch of smaller stores in San Antonio, and they just closed four within the last year, three or four stores. So I think small is telling you that's not for everybody, convenience size. We want to have a full and robust shop that's complemented by this curbside pickup or delivery to your house. And that in the store, you also have great opportunities to have culinary experiences, cooking, demos, uh, prepared food, prepared meals in the store and those opportunities. So we think this store, maybe a few years ago, I would have we would have been shooting for maybe 150,000 square feet. And 150 with curbside services, we think it's a very balanced offering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Will you still feature 1905 HEB vanilla uh, ice cream? <laughs> yes, I can, I can guarantee that. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. In the new yeah. package, also. Yeah, good, <laughs> good. Um, All right. We have a motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor of this uh, ordinance, uh, 6B, let it be known by the raised hand. And it is unanimous. Okay. And a gavel in another public hearing, and it is 720. And uh, this is 6C, if you'll read it in, Ms. Brown. Ordinance number 2019-01, creating a plan development district for professional office, retail trade one, and warehousing and distribution uses on an approximately 4.27 acre tract of land out of the Patrick Fleming survey number 666, abstract 145, within the city of Kerrville, Kerr County, Texas, more commonly known as 318 Leslie Drive, adopting a concept plan and conditions related to the development of said district containing a cumulative clause, containing a savings and severability clause, establishing a penalty or fine not to exceed $2,000 for each day of violation of any provision hereof, ordering publication and providing other matters related to the subject. Okay. Mr. Paxton? Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Brown mentioned this is Plan dis Development District for 318 Leslie Drive for professional office, retail trade, warehousing distribution. The request is not currently consistent with the comprehensive plan. <coughs> However, the Kerrville 2050 plan did not look at this specific neighborhood as it lays outside of one of the catalyst areas. The Kerrville 2050 plan focused <coughs> on those catalyst areas for redevelopment and future development and adopted the 2008 or 2002 <clears throat> future land use plan as was in place currently or previously. The current zoning of gateway is also not consistent with the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan actually recommends neighborhood residential for this area. The current area consists of a variety of uses including a handful of single family homes, multiple construction contractors' offices and yards, septic service company, mini warehouses, and a taxi and limousine service. 
So clearly the, the area does not fit the neighborhood residential that the comprehensive plan laid out. Like I said, this area was not specifically studied from those previous plans for the Kernel 2050 plan. One of the things the Kernel 2050 plan does talk about is that infill development and reinvestment into the community, which this project would qualify. Leslie Drive is designed as a collector street uh, to connect Loop 534 adjacent to the interstate down to Sydney Baker. <clears throat> and there is a, some truck traffic anticipated with the warehouse and distribution on this property. Planning and Zoning Commission recommended it for your approval, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Question. Um, I, I drove over we, there. We need to ask Sorry. The, yeah, in the public hearing, we That's need right. to ask if there are speakers. I don't have any speaker request forms for this item. Okay. All right. Okay. Then uh, go out of the public hearing at 723 and questions of the council. Several of the roads said you're now in the county as I was driving around there. Is it, is it, is there a part, is there a part of that area that isn't in the city? Is that correct? Yes. As you move to the, to the north west. and west, mm -hmm. you do leave the city limits. That's correct. But we kind of really border right on that. Right. E even if we had a catalyst area, it'd be right <laughs> on the edge. It's a uh, interesting. <clears throat> I looked at it today, and uh, there's a lot of clear land right there, mm -hmm. and then there are a few houses. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand there was very little objection at the PNZ from the neighbors of the area. That's correct. And it looks like a nice project for the area. For those of you that don't know where it is, if you're going out Sydney Baker toward Fredericksburg, and the Salt Group is on your right, the Valero is on your left, you go up Leslie Drive, and up there uh, on the right. Close to the interstate. And yeah, close, the close to where you can connect to the interstate. Correct. Uh, Drew, were there any objections from neighbors? There was some discussion of a possible phase of multifamily. Uh, there was some objection to that. Uh, so the applicant did not pursue that request. Uh, if they decide to change that, since it would not be consistent with this concept plan, they'd have to go back through the Planning Commission and City Council. But that was the only objection at that point. There was some objection questions about truck use and traffic and lighting. That's right. There was discussion of lighting. Uh, the truck traffic, there was discussion of traffic on Easy Street, um, but that would be minimal compared to what the traffic would be on Leslie, which is a collector street. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, okay. you got something? I guess one thing. Uh, on the landscaping regulations, are we <clears throat> regulating what they can plant, or are we recommending plants that they can plant? Where, where do you find those? It would be on page two of the ordinance at the very bottom. Just a recommendation of what they plant as far as their screening. Okay, so that's not... A they can plan whatever they want. Yes. Okay. Uh, Rudy. Yeah, I got a couple of questions that kind of have to do with the staff recommendations. So, first off, we went to PDD or plan development, which we're supposed to be minimizing those uses rather than adding them in. So that, that's one question. But but the other was, it's so you're, it's not in compliance with the. Kerrville 2050. It's apparently not uh, a land use that's approved by the gateway, which is the current zoning. So the current zoning, the future land use, not in compliance, and at P and Z, staff recommendation was denial. So how did we change to get it a recommendation of approval today? Staff recommendation was based solely on the policies within the comprehensive plan and the future land use plan through the discussion with the planning commission discussed how the current area the current zoning and the lack of review of the specific area is also not consistent um, the only consistent land use in the area would be the single family homes which is the, the minority of that area so staff although recommending against it based on written policy through the actual land uses, existing land uses in the surrounding area support the request. But if we had a couple of different land use decisions made in the past 10, 15 years, and they 
chose to change from what's currently there, why would we then go back to, I mean, it's almost, I don't know, what's the point of a plan if we don't, you know, execute it? What, what's the, why do we have a gateway district if we're just, you know, why do we have a comprehensive plan if we're just going to say, well, it's not in compliance, eh, whatever. As far as the gateway zoning, I wasn't here at that time. No, but either, either sure one of those, we're, we're basically <laughs> discarding both of them, both current zoning and future land use projections. We're discarding both of those to, uh, to approve a PD, which we're also trying to get away from. So I, I don't understand the, um, the policy choice of the recommendation, I guess, is, is really what it gets down to. The purpose <clears throat> of the PD is the fact that this location would be specific to the north districts which does not allow this use and we comprehensive plan recommended a rewrite of the zoning code which has not been completed so the zoning code as it currently sits is not in compliance <coughs> directly with the comprehensive plan and so to not hold up this project that's ready to start construction recommended a pd in, in that case you understand my point though right mm -hmm. i mean we're we're making exceptions for an exception Okay, just so we're all clear what we're doing. All right, that's all. What type of warehouse? Do we have any idea? And I know that's a, that's a, a broad question. Uh, I'll, I'll let the applicant explain that. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in reference to your question, it's a food grade. It's for local stores. Um, when everybody says warehouse, you think this huge thing. It's a very small location that is gonna uh, have food grade products that are uh, delivered to the stripes and to the, actually even some of the HB as well. So those products are, they come in once a week and then they, that's what they distribute to the different stripe stores uh, throughout the week. So the, the traffic really is very minimal in reference to the trucks because it's once a week the truck comes in um, and then at that point, uh, local uh, distributor trucks, the, the small ones, uh, residents that live in the area that work currently right now, um, actually go and distribute that product. And you may have explained uh, how big are the offices? Uh, the offices, I believe it's about 800 square feet or 1,000 square feet <coughs> that is there. Um, and then you have the storage area. And again, it's food grade, so it's not um, it, it, is, it is pegged to food, so cleanliness is very important, so you're not going to have, it's not for automotive or anything else, it is food grade. And the offices would be open to the community for rental? Uh, yes, the offices, um, we, d we developed this into uh, two phases, uh, as Drew has mentioned, and what we have seen in other communities is, is that the office space for um, small office, general contractors, accountants, uh, people that need an office, they're at home or uh, they're, they're in that transition where they don't need 4,000 square feet of uh, office space, but they would need anywhere from 1,000 to uh, 1,500 square feet to maybe a receptionist and two small areas inside. That's what we have seen has worked out in other communities very well. And so, uh, it would, it would be for uh, small businesses uh, <coughs> that would be uh, placed in there. And you've done this in other communities? Uh, yes, we have done this. Again, the, the food grade part is something that uh, we have done. And um, the small offices, what we have seen is that uh, we study each market that we go and see what is, what is the need, what is that. Every market is different. And one of the things in our research that we found um, this project has taken over a year to take off. So it is something that finally um, it, it got in, in place. And based on uh, our studies and our information, that is something that the city of Kerrville does need and, and uh, we saw uh, a request for. Great. I didn't realize he was going to be here, so can I ask just real quickly, yes, what's, um, what's your timeline on your phase two that you discussed at PNZ? Um, right now, the... Uh, as I have mentioned to planning and zoning, the, the first part is uh, phase one, and uh, we have to capitalize on the investment of people that are over here um, to try to jump into phase two as soon as phase one is finished. 
Um, phase one uh, should probably take six months to probably complete. So once phase one is completed, then we would continue into phase two. Um, and one of the things I think somebody mentioned about hedging and plants, uh, it is we are following the the city has mentioned in reference to the hedging that has to be done uh, around the property. Um, we are also dedicating the additional right of way required um, for the, the the street on Easy Street where mm -hmm. the right of way wasn't that was asphalt on private property, and so we're going to be uh, not only putting that but putting sidewalks in that whole general area. Phase two was contemplating that housing thing, right? Uh, yes, at this point, that's not something that... Uh, I know, that you're just thinking <coughs> about it, I, I know. Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions from council? If not, uh, all, uh, do I hear a motion for this item? I'll make a motion that we approve this ordinance number 20 and 19 dash 01 as presented. Okay. You're here a second. I'll second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of this uh, matter, if you'd let it be known by the raised hand. And it is unanimous. By a vote. I'd, I'd just like to say one final thought. I'd, I'd really like us to start getting away from the PDs as we've stated that was our goal. Okay. Uh, we move into or out of the public hearing. Um, and item number 7A, Ms. Brown, if you read that for us. Project funding agreement between the City of Kerrville, Texas Economic Improvement Corporation, the City of Kerrville, Texas, and Shriner University for the development and construction of an extension to the city's river trail to connect with. Shriner University's campus. Mr. Hopping. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, pleased to bring you uh, an item that we've discussed a couple times in EIC. Uh, ultimately, that project funding agreement uh, was approved at their uh, December meeting. Uh, putting up a PowerPoint here that I'll go through with you briefly. Uh, just a brief summary uh, on what is before us tonight. Uh, we do have a funding request for approximately a one plus mile uh, spur off of the com now completed five miles of river trail. Uh, that will go from uh, G Street uh, down the right of way along 27, cross under the bridge uh, just past uh, the cemetery area, uh, and uh, which is on uh, Shriner University property at that point. Uh, wrap around uh, part of Quinlan Creek uh, across a bridge area onto their main campus where they are proposing a trailhead at that location. Uh, the amenity was proposed by Shrine University really as a, a, again, an amenity not only for the community but an amenity for them uh, in their efforts to help grow their campus enrollment uh, and better market the university, uh, which is a, a catalyzing factor for our, our local economy. Uh, it was identified as an action item in the Kerrville 2050 Comprehensive Plan. Uh, and it also helps connect the adjacent neighborhoods and area businesses uh, and really provides a trailhead in an area of the community where we don't have a trailhead right now. Um, the request uh, from the EIC was for $1.5 million. Uh, and again, this is a three-way agreement between the EIC as a funding mechanism, uh, Shriner University as a landowner and as a, a, a large portion of the trail location, uh, and then, of course, the city uh, ultimately as the one who will uh, work through the design engineering efforts as well as the uh, supervising the construction efforts. Uh, again, this was an item that was identified within your Kerrville 2050 comprehensive plan uh, within the key priority area of uh, parks, open space, and river corridor. A uh, couple of different guiding principles here, uh, focusing on enhancing investing, investing in uh, existing assets that we have, uh, and then also focusing on connecting businesses and neighborhoods and major destinations uh, to the river corridor. Uh, there was a specific action item uh, uh, P6.3, uh, which was creating a pedestrian bike connector from Shriner, Shriner University to the River Trail. Uh, again, this is the River Trail map showing the existing five miles uh, of the, the backbone of the trail, if you will, uh, to what is now connected at, at the far western terminus uh, at the Dieter Center, uh, all the way along going through uh, Luis Hayes Park, uh, and then on to uh, the existing uh, terminus on the east end or southeast end, uh, located at uh, or nearby uh, Kerrville Shriner Park. This was an item that uh, you all took up several months ago as well as the, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board 
uh, but essentially looked at various expansion efforts uh, that had been proposed. Uh, essentially, the uh, yellow areas, the existing trail, the areas in red uh, are the ele elements of your master plan uh, that were approved conceptually, uh, basically having, a, a, at some point in the future, uh, growing a loop around uh, Nimitz Lake and connecting to uh, the existing parts of the trail in that area, again, the, to the Dieter Center uh, uh, trailhead that we just discussed, uh, and then also a, a similar loop uh, towards the bottom, uh, and this would be a, a part of that, uh, and then some other uh, spur elements, and one of those spurs was uh, labeled as one, and these aren't in any uh, priority or order by any means, but uh, that uh, spur one to Shriner University was identified within your master plan that was approved. This is a conceptual drawing uh, that was developed uh, essentially, uh, up at the top left corner, uh, you'll see that's the G Street connection. Uh, the proposed trail is the area that's in the dotted red. Uh, that will go along the uh, uh, several properties there uh, between G Street uh, and the right of way located uh, along uh, Highway 27. Again, crossing under the bridge there at 27, sort of wrapping around the cemetery area along a really a beautiful stretch of Quinlan Creek, uh, crossing the creek. Uh, and then uh, crossing a field area uh, that goes over to the existing pavilion uh, where the trailhead and parking location is proposed uh, at Shriner University. You also see in the blue area, uh, that is a proposed uh, crushed granite trail uh, that uh, Shriner University will be uh, installing uh, here in the near term. Uh, and that element not only provides additional asset uh, for uh, trail users, but uh, it also uh, Shriner University uh, attendees as well, uh, but also the neighborhood in general. And it really speaks to an effort and, and, and this uh, entirety of this effort uh, in Shriner really desiring to ha have the community embrace the university and be able to utilize the university. Uh, and so that's the way this, this deal has been crafted. So just a brief agreement summary, essentially uh, uh, what this funding agreement uh, provides for is that the EIC will be the funding mechanism to provide $1.5 million for the trail extension, two equal installments, one in this fiscal year, one in the next fiscal year. Again, the city will, will be the, the entity primarily design, uh, responsible for the design and the engineering of the project, acquiring the necessary easements, and then ultimately uh, uh, facilitating the construction contract. Uh, Shriner University is committed to uh, providing the necessary recreation easements for the construction of the River Trail Extension, uh, being that the vast majority of it is on their property, uh, providing for an easement for the parking at the trailhead, uh, constructing, again, that perimeter campus trail uh, with public access that we talked about, uh, providing 50000 in direct funding support towards the effort, uh, and then providing 365-day public access, both pedestrian and vehicular, to that trailhead, uh, from generally uh, from that Park Street, uh, Trap Street intersection and campus entrance. Uh, constructing publicly accessible restrooms near the trailhead uh, within two years uh, of, the, uh, of the completion uh, and then maintaining uh, uh, you know, uh, faculty employment levels uh, at least to <coughs> the current levels that they have right now and that really speaks to that, uh, the jobs component. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Uh, Council, do you have any questions for Mr. Hoffman? I got a couple of questions, Mayor. Uh, how many properties is it crossing? It's different properties, property owners. Let me go back here on the map right here. Um, so uh, there's six properties uh, in total. Oh, you can't see it there. There's six properties in total. Uh, most of those properties, uh, the smaller properties are located uh, closer to G Street. Uh, the vast majority, uh, I'd say 80% uh, uh, of the trail extension is located on Shriner University property. Do they own across 27 right there? Yes, sir. Okay, that yes, makes sir. sense. Is any of that developable, or is it just all in the floodplain? You know, all in the floodplain. Flood okay. Yes, it's beautiful, but really undevelopable. Go ahead, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Rudy? Yeah, I got a couple. Where's the, on the map, which, um, the design of the project, it shows some 10-foot, some 8-foot, some 6-foot. Where, where are those sections? So the, uh, the vast majority of the area, uh, what I'll say south of 27, uh, is the 10-foot, and that will have the toe-down elements to it. Uh, there are uh, uh, components um, north, what would be north or uh, west of 27 going to the area. Some of those areas uh, will not need the full-blown trail segments that are much more expensive to produce. Uh, and so uh, that will be some of the eight foot more, uh, they'll, they'll, the user won't know it, uh, but they will be uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, 
constructed like a sidewalk. Okay. Um, and then the other question I had is kind of a, okay, so this is a three-part thing. EIC is essentially given a million and a half to the city to build their part. So um, in the 50000 that Shriners giving, are, are they giving it to the city toward building it, or who are they giving the 50000 to? That's correct. Okay, so it, in the funding agreement, it's got, I guess you'd call it a clawback, where if Shriner doesn't do their part, whatever that is, um, they give money to EIC. Why would it go to EIC if the city's EIC gives their money to the city? So why why would it go that direction? So you're right in that the EIC is giving money to the city, but it's for the project. And if you know for whatever reason we got great bids, and hopefully we do, and it only came in at 1.2 million, and we only spent 1.2 million, that would go back to the EIC. Yeah, I get that, but the the project itself will be owned by the city, right? EIC is funding it. So if there's some Shriner problem in the in the delivery of it, because I guess they're given a couple years to do the bathroom or something, right. it seems like that should go to the city since they're the owner at that point. But that's a, um, a logistic thing. And then the, the last one is more of a curiosity thing. So last month we EIC gave money to the developer to build infrastructure, and this this time EIC is giving money. To the city to develop the infrastructure. In both cases is public infrastructure. Why? Why do we choose? Why didn't we choose the city as the developer of the the other one? Is, it, is there a reason? Yeah, essentially, you know, you've got in that in that case, uh, you had that was uh, very much uh, uh, a developer-driven uh, project uh, that um, you know they were. Uh, we contend they will be able to do it cheaper um, you know at this point there are not property owners on this that uh, can you know do this project and complete this project uh, that have the experience of, of building river trails um, you know and, and, and a desire to go out there and assemble these properties and, and get these easements and do that so it's just a little bit uh, you know different demand uh, for, for product and ability just to, to make that product happen all right okay uh, just uh, you may have mentioned it, a time period for all of this. Uh, so our hope is to uh, uh, we're, we're going to be uh, assuming your approval tonight. We'll be working on a design engineering effort that we'll be uh, anticipate bringing to you probably in the next uh, four to six weeks. Uh, you know, we would uh, I would think uh, design should not take uh, uh, a tremendous amount of time. Uh, our hope is to let a construction <coughs> project uh, late summer, early fall. Uh, and you know have this project you know complete in the uh, you know, early 2020 time frame. Yeah. It's exciting. It's just truly exciting. Uh, well, I've been involved for weeks with EIC, being on the EIC board. So I, we we've answered a lot of questions regarding safety features on the trail that go under the bridge, and and I was very satisfied with the the, the answers I got regarding lighting and clear patch, patch its ways and access and so and signage you know when it comes to pointing where the restrooms would be and so I'm I'm very satisfied with how the design will probably end up and we'll get to use the trail to go to breakfast at the Shiner uh, cafeteria <laughs> and walk it off from the back. <laughs> yeah, we've learned a few things as we've gone along the way and certainly as we've uh, developed the last five miles and we're very excited about this extension as well. I enjoy the river trail very much, and uh, just one item related to this, the area around the cemetery is really beautiful. I have a grandson buried on the north side of the cemetery, and so I've, I've seen that, that area, it's just, it really is nice. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion in regard to this item? I would love to make a motion. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, did I ask for speakers? I don't. We don't have any? I don't have any. Okay, all right. Uh, all right. All right. Ms. I Agnes. would like to move that we approve the project funding agreement between the city of Kerrville, uh, the Shriner University, and uh, the EIC for the construction of an extension of the city's river trail to connect Shriner University campus. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. We have a motion to second. Uh, all in favor of that item, if you'll let me know by the raised hand. Okay. And it 
is passed unanimously. Okay, 7B, Ms. Brown, if you would read that for us. We did 7D. E, 7D. E, e, I'm sorry. B. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Authorize execution of a construction contract for the Legion lift station with Keystone Construction in the amount of five million four hundred ninety-three thousand and six hundred and sixty-three dollars. Okay, Mr. Hoppy. Yes, sir. Um, before you tonight, uh, we have an item that was uh, identified both in your wastewater uh, master planning effort in 2012, uh, as well as the Kerrville uh, 2050 comprehensive uh, plan. Uh, we are pleased, uh, and we've, we've spoken with this item uh, with you a number of times, uh, particularly related to talk Texas uh, Water Development Board funding, uh, as well as uh, EIC funding. We're very pleased to uh, bring uh, quality bids uh, to you uh, tonight uh, and a uh, proposed uh, low bid of uh, 5493663 million four hundred ninety three six sixty three to Keystone. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, but the project hasn't changed at all from when we presented to you before. So, uh, given given what we were looking at in terms of cost and this cost, you you said a quality bidder. You mm -hmm. everything checks out. Yes, uh, we have uh, uh, checked out references uh, of other projects, and uh, we believe Keystone to be a, a quality contractor that we look forward to do bid, doing business with. All right. Okay. I'm going to start over here. Ms. Sigerman, any well, questions? Well, I guess this is probably not directly related to this request, but I was just the, the additional money that we're going to have. I guess we're working on some options, some other projects that we might need it on. Is that? Yes. As you recall, uh, as we were going through the design effort, we were seeing rising escalation costs that we were very concerned mm -hmm. about. Uh, right. And so uh, when we uh, went forward with the application for the Texas Water Development Board funding, we asked for $8 million to uh, fully prepare ourselves for uh, bids that may be mm -hmm. much higher than what we ended up getting. Um, uh, it, you know, and so with the, with the bids, essentially uh, where we're at, uh, when you uh, look at uh, the, the, the bid element that came through, potential contingency, uh, the design engineering costs, which are reimbursable, as well as uh, some of the uh, grant administrative elements, um, we are anticipating right now, we want to get through the construction project, but right now we're anticipating uh, somewhere around 2.2, 2.25 uh, million. And so uh, one of the things that we have the ability to do is to go to, back to the Water Development Board and to say we like to reapply those funds to a, a, an alternative wastewater project uh, within the applicability of what uh, they allow for. Uh, and so we are in the process of assessing that right now, but we absolutely have needs within the 2012 uh, master plan that uh, we'd, we'd like to bring back forward to you uh, once we are a little further along uh, in, in uh, this project. Good. Okay. Look forward to Zaya? I have no questions. Mr. Brady. Yeah, so kind of along the lines of what you just described, you, you mentioned 2.2 or something like that. So what we really have is for this project, $10 million has been funded for it, or yes, sir. guaranteed funding or whatever you want to call it. Yes, sir, that's correct. And it's looking like we're only going to need 6.3, something like that. So, uh, again, remember that there's design engineering costs, so it's about $750,000 uh, right, in that's there added that are to reimbursable. Uh, from that, as well as uh, some of the the grant costs, and I believe those are under a hundred thousand. Right. So, so we're looking at three quarters of a million added to five point four or five point five. So we're looking at six point three. So we're looking at with three contingency as well. We we're planning for <coughs> roughly twenty five percent right. contingency. We're looking at over three million dollars, maybe three and a half. That's extra, and we've gone through the trouble recently of raising the water rates based on the need to do this, even though. I think we all realize that it's really based on a different need, but whatever, it's primarily we focused on this. I understand that we have other projects. I get that. Um, we also have other projects that we have long-term investment budgeted for. Um, this is not money we expected to use for those. This is money that we had been told when at EIC we would reduce the amount and so it seems to me, I mean, we're not voting on this particular aspect tonight, but I'd really like us to look hard at how we're going to tell people that we just raised their rates so that we could borrow more than we needed. Um, so I'd like us to look really hard at that. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, if I can comment on that. Yeah. As explained during our budget work sessions, the, re the primary reason for the increase on the rates was operational. Yes, we had some increase in debt service, 
But when you look at the last time that we increased our water rates was in 2012, and our expenses in, in operations have grown significantly without a rate increase, that was the primary driver. And without a doubt, we did have increase in debt. But to say alone it was related to this project, that's just not accurate. It's not what I said. So we don't have to go into that discussion. Um, it wasn't the intent. But we raised rates, and we, we, the rates that we raised over the next 20 years did not match the operational adjustments that we're going to be making. And part of the reason we were raising the rates was to keep our debt cap at a certain level. Yes, it's due to a lot of factors, but bottom line is this is this is going to turn out to be three some three plus million dollars that is possibly usable later, possibly not. But I, we need to be able to answer to the people why we're borrowing more than we need. And I'm I'm sure we will do that when we cross that bridge of how we're we determine. Today. No, we're not crossing it today. Yeah, we when we de when we determine uh, how we're going to handle that and what's going to be done, uh, it is a great rate, and uh, so so we'll come back and look at that issue of how we use uh, what remains. Okay. Anything? I just I had to comment that I'm glad we're finally doing this project. I feel it should have been done a long time ago. <coughs> moving in the right direction. Okay. All right. Um, Mayor, we got someone that wants to speak. I'm sorry. Got someone, someone to speak? Okay, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I just have a Gary Cooper, 124 Aaron Drive. I have a question, uh, Mr. Hoppy or Mr. McDaniel, whoever would like to address it. EIC, um, you brought up that we put $2 million toward this, and uh, I was just wondering if they're not, if that's not being used. Uh, is there going to be some recoupment of that back to EIC? Because uh, we made a, we put in up to two million, depending on how much we borrowed from the state, and it looks like we're not doing that. Or, and it was all attributable to the Legion lift station. So, I don't think that that money, that two million dollar commitment, can go to other projects because that's not what we voted it for. So I just wanted to address that issue. Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask the city manager to address this and then we're gonna move on because that, that's a, another issue for another time. The EIC money is the first money in and the first money out. And so that money will be spent before we use the te Texas Water Development Board funds. So any balance that's due, either the council will decide to return that money to the Water Development Board or never really call it or they'll um, ask for it to be used for another project. Okay, all right. Okay, so if it's not used for the Legion lift station, Mark, then you're gonna ask EIC to use it for something else? No, no. it's going to be used for the Legion lift station. EIC money is the first dollar spent. Okay. First two million is going from EIC. Okay. That's what's going That's on. all I was trying to find Okay, out. thank, thank you. you. All right, do we have a motion on this item? I'll make a motion that we authorize execution of a construction contract with Keystone Construction. <laughs> okay. Uh, do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. <coughs> Motion is second. Uh, all in favor of this uh, 7B item for the construction of the Legion Lift Station, uh, let it be known by the raised hand. Okay. And it is uh, unanimous. Okay. 7C. Ms. Brown, if you'll read that for us. <laughs> Authorized execution of a professional services agreement with LNV Engineering to develop the drainage master plan in the amount of $204,348. Okay. All right, Mr. Hoppy again. Yes, sir. Uh, we are pleased to bring you another Kerrville 2050 uh, comprehensive planning item uh, to check off the list tonight. Uh, one of the uh, elements that was identified within your uh, key priority area of water uh, uh, and wastewater and drainage uh, and the guiding principle of developing and maintaining a long-range plan for stormwater drainage management, addressing and prioritizing infrastructure needs, and identifying funding sources. Essentially, the city has uh, never had uh, a drainage comprehensive uh, drainage master plan, and so uh, that is what we have uh, looked at developing uh, for you. And so we have sought some outside assistance with an engineering firm, uh, LNV, which we have experience with with some other projects, as you recall. Uh, they have facilitated uh, our solid waste permitting effort uh, with TCEQ uh, related to the landfill uh, and done some other auxiliary work. Uh, so we feel very confident they've done uh, this drainage work in other communities. We feel very confident moving forward 
Uh, essentially, it will be creating, uh, uh, looking at uh, a basin-wide uh, element or basin by basin uh, uh, drainage uh, analysis uh, of those stormwater uh, uh, storms uh, as they come in, how that stormwater uh, reacts, how it flows. Um, uh, we've talked about a number of issues uh, in the community uh, with our drainage flowing primarily through our streets, uh, which has a number of impacts to our street pavement and wear surfaces. And so uh, this will look at all of those mechanisms as well as some identified problem areas that uh, we repeatedly uh, hear about over the years. And so uh, it will be looking at both the global scope as well as some specific elements. Now, it won't have the, the full-blown engineering design fix on each one of those, but it will get us much, much closer uh, towards that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I've talked to Mr. Barron about this. Man, I hope somebody looks at the 600 block of Harper Street okay. it, off that hill, is that, and it just stays there for days. Sure. And uh, anyway, yeah, we, okay. Um, council, questions in regard to this at matter? I just have a curiosity question. You, have you identified neighborhood areas, some? Uh, there has certainly been some elements, uh, you know, we'll be looking to, uh, you know, this, this effort will help us more fully catalog yeah. uh, those uh, as well as model those. Uh, you know, you can, you can have rain at one end of town and not on the other, and, and you know, it, it, so it, it it's always depends on the storm, depends on the severity of the storm, depends on the severity of the storm in the basin, the timing of those basins. This is going to help us all with, with those efforts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else on council? Yeah, I got it. I got a couple, but one is actually what you mentioned. So back when we first brought this up at a workshop, we, you, you threw out some hot spot areas, mm -hmm. and we added, or we threw a couple more out. One of them was what he just described was the uh, between Culberson and Lewis on Harper. It, like you said, it sits there for days. It's up over the water on a high rain. It doesn't even have to be a storm. It's just something. And um, so I, I, and I see that we added Jack Street or something from prior it got added it would be nice if we considered looking at this other hot spot and if it's a matter of money for them to look at it I would say I'd prioritize that over looking for a recreational kayak <coughs> as far as a choice because that's if I'm understanding it that's a that's a chunk of change in this thing and I'd, I'd really like to answer that drainage problem there I, don't, I mean that's a sort of a question for council but um, and then, in general, I think master plans are great. We're writing them all the time. That's great. Um, but I'm hoping that, again, this is a master plan that we're going to actually execute as opposed to, again, recently with the wastewater master plan, we called it conceptual. Or the comp plan just a little bit ago when we decided it's not in compliance, but for whatever reason, we're bypass. I would expect that this is... I mean, we're going to spend two hundred thousand dollars on some master plan. I'm hoping it's a little more than conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, let me clarify. I, I just wanted to emphasize that we will not have construction documents generated out of these for these specific projects. Uh, they will be at a conceptual level that certainly can evolve as uh, we we launch off on specific engineering efforts for each one of the solutions right. to these. But you know what I'm referring to, and that was a little more than a concept. That it wasn't a con it wasn't a construction document either. But anyways, um, that being said, I you know like I say, anyways. Go okay, ahead. Mr. Bolton. Not anything. Do I hear a motion on this item? I'd, I'd make a motion that we award the contract to L&V for the master plan. Um, and I would add the extra that we get this one extra hot spot added into the scope. And if it means pushing the kayak, then we push the kayak. But I'm, I'm making a motion that we approve the, the contract with the uh, consider a, the council consider adding that hot spot into the scope of work. I'm sorry, could, you, on Harper? could you specify? Yeah, the hot spot? okay, so it's um, Harper Street between Culberson and Lewis. Okay. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor of, of this item, if you'll let me know by the raised hand. Okay, thank you, and it passes unanimously. Okay, um, we go to 8A. Uh, this is, Ms. Brown, if you'll read that in for us. 
uh, Freedom's Path regarding the uh, Kerrville VA Medical Center Phase 2. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. Craig Taylor, if you would uh, share with us. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to come and talk with you. Um, seven years ago, we signed a lease with the VA uh, Kerrville Division to develop housing on the campus as a part of a nationwide effort by the VA to utilize property that they had for the benefit of veterans vis-a-vis -vis housing. Uh, after many years, we were finally able to develop Freedom's Path Phase 1, which is a 49-unit multifamily development on the campus with a multi-purpose community center, uh, which is professionally managed uh, by Pinnacle Management. It's done very well. We're providing those 49 units. When we did that development, and uh, Michael Wellborn is here, Michael did our initial uh, site plan, we carved out another 1.1 acre uh, location <coughs> there for a phase two. And it is now uh, a possibility that we can move forward with phase two. The way this is financed is through a program through the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. We finance phase one this way and we are hoping to be able to finance phase two if you support us with uh, housing tax credits. And these are allocated by TDHCA to developers. Developers then take that and they uh, sell those credits to a uh, company that needs a federal tax uh, break and they, the company then puts the money into the project and because we can then buy down the cost of the project in terms of debt, we can offer lower rents. So these properties come with some rent and income restrictions as well. Um, to apply to TDHCA is highly competitive. Uh, Texas is a very, very competitive state. It's, uh, the state is divided up into 13 regions, which are urban and rural, so there are 26 pots of money that can be accessed. Uh, the state usually allocates one or two projects in each of those regions or subregions. So this is in subregion or rural region nine. Um, to score enough points, there are two things that any developer is going to need from the local government. Uh, the first is a resolution of support for the project. Um, so as I sent the letter out, this would be no more than 48 units, but 48 units or less with an income restriction range from a low of 30% to a high of 80%. Let me just a little aside. That 80% ability was, did not exist when we did phase one. Um, that 80% ability of median income was created in the Tax Reform Act last year. So it allowed us to expand the income criteria. One of the criticisms, and it's a legitimate criticism of phase one, is that a lot of people wanted to live there because it was so nice, but because of the income restrictions we had, we could not move them in. They, we would not have been in compliance. So this gives us the opportunity to expand the income spectrum, if you will. So we would need a resolution support, and I could provide as much information as you need on that. And then the second thing is uh, a, it's a one-point category, but every point matters. Um, we need a commitment of funding by the local government um, of at least $250. Uh, and that can be in the form of cash of some sort, or it could be in the form of some kind of deferred fee. So we could take up a collection right now, right? I can't. <laughs> Let's get that done. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's great. Uh, and let me just say that in phase one, that requirement was $200,000. And the Home Depot Foundation made a grant to the city of Kerrville, and the city of Kerrville made a grant to the project for that 200000 which was the way we got by on that. Um, and it bore fruit, and you know, it's a wonderful development. Now it's just $250, but it could be in a waiver of uh, building permit fees or other kind of plan review fees or that sort of thing. So the final piece of this is 
this application, well, two pieces. This application is due March 1st, so we're going to have to really work on that. I submitted the pre-application yesterday. Um, so the way that the process works is you self-score your pre-application. And our pre-application scored 119 points. Last year, two projects got funded in Region 9, and I think it's pronounced Comal County, um, and they both pre-app scored 120 points. So we are down one point from the maximum that could possibly be scored. Um, and just the reason is the uh, state incentivizes developers to put their projects in high-income areas because of a lawsuit that went to the U.S. Supreme Court in Texas, which uh, said that Texas process was concentrating poverty. So now there's an incentivization to put these projects in higher income census tracts. The census tract where the VA is, is in a, what is called a quartile three tract. Immediately across the highway is a quartile two tract. <coughs> so that quartile two tract would have brought two points, whereas a quartile three only will bring us one point, not because of quartile three, but because we're real close to quartile two. Anyway, so it gets off into the weeds. My point in all of that, and the reason I wanted to come tonight with no action or anything, is to uh, meet y'all, because none of you were here five or six years ago when we started this process the first time, and to let you know that we would very much like to do this project, um, but to say that there's a possible chance we won't be able to do the project, because this pre-app now is the final app pre-app is due tomorrow. That gets posted to the uh, webpage for TDHCA of every development in all of Texas. And so we'll be able to look at the competition in the 12 counties in Region 9. And if three or four of those, or even two, score 120, and we only score 119, then in all likelihood it's a moot point. We're not going to spend the tens of thousands of dollars it takes to even submit an application. On the other hand, if we're at 119 and there's nobody else that can beat us, uh, then we're going to go ahead and submit, subject to, with your willingness, me coming back here and asking you to pass a resolution of support and to authorize somebody in the city to write a letter of support saying that you will fund us an amount of at least $250. Okay. I failed to do something. I, I mentioned your name, but would, would you give your name and your address? <coughs> Absolutely. Craig Taylor, 191 Edgewood Avenue, Atlanta, Georgia, 30303. Um, let me just say, we, we set up a company, Communities for Veterans, to do these projects on VA medical center campuses around the United States. Our first one was in Hines, Illinois, on the Hines VA hospital campus, 72 units. Our second project was here in Kerrville, 49. Our third in Vancouver, Washington, 50 units. Our fourth in Chillicothe, Ohio, 60 units. Our fifth and sixth in Augusta, Georgia, 78 units and 20 units. Our seventh in Fort Harrison, uh, Helena, Montana, which is 42 units. And now we finished the phase two at Hines, Illinois, of 52 units. Uh, we're a little bit of company. Uh, we are doing this for the love of country and for gratitude towards our vets. Um, so I just wanted to say that, that uh, I am Atlanta, Georgia. I'm not Kerrville, Texas. We're using Kerrville folks wherever we can. Uh, and uh, we, we love this city, and it's been a beautiful place for us to have a community. And uh, thank you all for that. But uh, if we are able to move forward, I would certainly like the opportunity to come back in the next month and ask you for a resolution. Let me, before you get away, any questions I got, from the council? I got, I got two. So uh, current phase one, you're, you're at capacity? Yes and no. Sometimes we are. More or less. You Not are. now. Uh, no. The end of the year, um, we, we have six vacancies there right now, and all of that occurred in the last month or so. so I mean, it's constantly changing. Yeah, but yeah. It, it, but right. It's a turnover, but yes, we stay at capacity. In, in the competitive nature of what you, of this program, is it, is it the points only, or is it 
could somebody else in this area be competing directly against you and have if we got asked by somebody else it, it I mean, are we hurting either one of you by supporting both of you in, with a resolution? Or is, it, is your application without our resolution going to battle each other and we're not really a part of it? You know what I'm saying? Well, that, yes, I think pretty real clear. Um, without your resolution, it, this thing is right. yeah, it's not, not going. And that would be the case for any other developer. My counsel to local communities is to support anyone and everyone whom you feel comfortable supporting and don't pick winners and losers. And why would I say that? Because apart from what I'm trying to do with veterans, uh, is if this happens and somebody builds 48 units, that's going to pour nine to ten million dollars into your local community yeah. and fill a much needed problem of workforce housing and of the shortage of workforce housing. And that's a big social need and a social good. So I don't want the competition part of it to preclude anybody from being able to provide that benefit. If that doesn't, funding doesn't go to Kerrville, it's gonna to go to somewhere else in Texas. Yes. So I encourage local governments uh, to support as many developers that come forward. Now, sometimes the rules are written that say you can only support one, okay. uh, but it's probable that somebody could come into Kerrville and score 120 points on the pre-app, not 119 if they were in a high in income area, and they could do that, uh, and we would lose to them. Um, and I would be sorry, but... But you wouldn't uh, lose to them because of our... So if we supported both of you, you're not getting harmed by that, is no, what you're basically saying. No. Okay, thank okay, you. Let, let me be clear. Is there somebody else out there who's bidding on this? Yeah. On this? Yeah. No, sir. Not on this project, but there'll be other tax. That funding. Other, other, yeah. fund, other projects. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Mr. Fogel? Uh, how, how close is it to the existing apartments? Next door. I mean, is it going to be on the northeast side, I guess, back towards the solar panels? It's going to be right on the front side, right next to the existing building. But okay. It, it will face the VA campus, just okay. like the existing building does. Uh, Same kind of model of everything. Yeah, three story elevator. Uh, central atrium. It won't have the separate community building that the present building would have. It would be within the atrium of the existing building. Good. You, uh, so gonna... My question, did you come all the way from Atlanta just to tell us this tonight? Yes, ma'am, I did. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love Cedar Pond. You came to the right place. Yeah. I, I was just curious, when will you know again? Tomorrow, did you say? Well, it's, uh, it's several stages. So the application pre-apps are due tomorrow. And I haven't done one of these in five or six years in Texas. So I expect that these will be the scores and the applications will be posted Friday or maybe early next week. And I'll know then. And then we have the six or seven weeks to hustle up mm -hmm. and get an application right. in. Um, well, good luck. I mean, oh, I, uh, I, the chips fall where they may, but still, I, that sounds like a very admirable cause. Thank you. Let me, let me ask you this. Is, are the units only for veterans? No, sir. Um, we wish we would uh, be able to serve um, only veterans, if you will. Um, but the <coughs> finances of these projects are such that you can't sit with a vacant unit. So if they're not veterans to fill the unit, you got to fill the unit because your operating expenses are paid there and it gets off into some other technical things about tax credits. Um, and, and so it goes back to a point I made earlier. One of the things we discovered is that we had a lot of veterans who wanted to live in phase one but made too much money. Uh, and, and the limit for phase one is 60% of AMI. The AMI uh, in, in uh, Kirk County is about I don't remember exactly, but about $45,000. So you take 60% of that, and you're looking at people who have to make less than $27,000, $28,000 to live there. So we had a lot of vets who wanted to live there, but they just made too much money. Uh, so by expanding, going from 60% to 80%, we can expand the income width of who is eligible to live there. <laughs> we do have the possibility of making units some units non-restricted at all, 
and based on our experience, uh, given the high quality of this housing, um, that we might be able to make that work financially. It, it's an exponent of difficulty when you take and do market rate or non-restricted units in the restricted, and I won't go into all of that. Uh, but when the percentage changed, it didn't change phase one percentages. No, ma'am. No. In fact, um, I was saying today that sometimes when laws change, um, you can go back and ask for a, uh, a waiver or something like mm -hmm. that to expand it. And I, am, I don't know of anybody who's done that anywhere in the country, uh, but we're certainly going to ask because that would solve... Uh, we turned down a veteran today uh, to move in who made you know, 40000 uh, who we've been able to move in had we had an expanded income with. Let me say one other thing, if you a little bit of a drumbeat as to whomever builds this kind of housing. This program was set up in 1986 by uh, President Reagan in the previous Tax Reform Act. And one of the reasons for doing this was that public housing was such an abysmal failure and such a blight on many communities that the president wanted the private sector involved and the president wanted to see high quality housing built even for working class people, lower income people. And so the private sector drives this and the private sector is at risk. If these deals fail, it's not the federal government that loses the money, it's the developers and investors and so forth. And the second thing is, the housing is built in such high quality that it will compete with almost any other kind of Class A apartment community out there. So we're very proud of the product, and we're very proud to be able to do this uh, for and with our veterans. But I, I, I am sorry that for a lot of reasons we're not able to make it veterans only. Uh, but in this case, for economic reasons, we have had to open it up to non-veterans. That said, you need workforce housing, and we're proud oh, to be able to provide you're workforce housing. You're exactly right. Mr. Taylor, thank you. Yes, thank sir. you very much. All right. Okay. Financial update. Yeah, Ms. Dozier. Oh, yeah. I do. I, I was just handed one for Clinton Thomas, Jr. Oh, okay, on this issue. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm a veteran myself. And I have seen the housing on the, on the VA. And there were many veterans that I spoke to that because of the amount of money they had to be able to make were uh, excluded. And so I would wish that that limit would be raised as well. I think he spoke about that. So if this is what the committee can do, I'm asking that it be raised as much as it can because there's a lot of veterans that um, have gone to the program and because of the way the rules were written, they weren't able to get in. Yeah, okay. But I'm very thankful. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Dozier, financial update. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Y'all have covered a lot of ground already. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna give a brief financial update we are looking at um, financial statements through the end of November, so for the first two months of our fiscal year. <coughs> Starting with the general fund, um, we have revenue of $3.6 million compared to expense of $3.9 million on a year-to-date basis. It is normal to have a deficit at this time of the year because of the um, seasonal nature of our property tax collections. Um, a couple of things to note on the revenue side, we're still a little higher than um, budget and a little higher than uh, last year on the property tax side, uh, we think that that is due to uh, the property tax bills being mailed out earlier this year than they were last year. On the sales tax side, which is always our volatile revenue that we look at, um, it's down just a little bit um, in November compared to November of 2017. Um, but we're very close to budget, and then the good news is we have already received sales tax for the month of December, and we had a a really large gain in December of 17%. There were some one-time items um, included in that that you have some notes on in your agenda bill, 
but overall we were still up over 5% um, in December and so we're trending a little bit better than budget on sales tax which is always a good thing. On the general fund expenditure side of things we're tracking close to budget um, just slightly below. Moving on to the water fund, um, a summary there is we've had revenues of 1.8 million compared to expenditures of 1.9 million on a year-to-date <coughs> basis. And looking at the revenues, this is where um, we're seeing some significant variances from budget. Um, water and reuse sales and sewer also um, are down significantly um, compared to budget, um, primarily due to the record rainfall that we received during the month of October. Um, so, you know, it is it is very volatile revenue depending on how things turn out the rest of the year. We might be able to make it up, um, but we are proactively looking at um, expenditures and things that we can, um, that we might be able to uh, curtail or control to offset some of that lost, lost revenue. Um, on the water fund expenditure side, um, we're coming in a little bit lower than budget right now. Our expenditures are looking fine there. Um, then looking at other funds, a few other funds to highlight. We have this new development services fund this year. Um, so this was something that we talked about during the budget workshop. We've broken this out of the general fund and um, we wanna have some better transparency around development services. Um, so you can see um, that year to date, um, we have revenues of 188,000 compared to expenditures of 108,000. Um, and just to note, um, on the prior year comparison there, I have pulled last year's revenues out of the general fund, so you can have something to compare. The golf fund is experiencing the same thing as the water fund. They definitely were hurt by the, the rainfall in October, and their revenues are down some. And on the hotel occupancy fund, um, we are showing revenues that um, do not match the expenditures. Um, but we've had a large quarterly payment um, to the um, CBB, and we haven't received a full quarter worth of revenue, so it is um, you know, something normal to expect at this time of the year. And then just a note um, from last month, we, um, we are gonna present compared to budget and on, on a year-to-date basis, and then also compared to the prior year. Um, we will definitely look at rolling 12-month <coughs> information. The finance department will as we need to, to answer you know, specific questions or look for certain trends, um, but we'll continue presenting in this manner since it's consistent with the way we're required to budget and our required financial reporting. And that's all I have. Um, any questions? Yeah, I do. <coughs> yes, sir. So that, so that last, the last comment, um, so I, I think maybe by the comment, it sounds like maybe you guys misunderstood what I was asking for last month. I wasn't asking to replace the comparisons that we do I was asking to add to it um, in, in my view for the sake of transparency but also I think it's actually less confusing for the simple reason that when we try and do any trend analysis whatsoever if anybody who, who wants to look at that could see it they would want to see a longer trend than a month or two which is what we're looking at with a year to date at the beginning of a fiscal year when we're doing budget versus revenue that's one thing. But when we're doing revenue versus expense, what, what can you know from a month or two? I mean, it gets us too micro-focused on a small time. So it, it, it's a, the request is to make a report that can just be a push button, kick out the basic departments. Um, and a 12-month um, rolling time period kind of puts a wash on what we're looking at right now, like you'll, you'll show one department, it'll, it'll be short, you'll have to speculate as to why it's, you know, you'll have to analyze why that trend is that way. Maybe you don't even have to analyze it if it's a year long trend. Um, I mean, you guys do what you like, but that's what the request was about. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And yes, um, on those detail uh, analysis, um, items we definitely do that kind of thing within the finance department we just feel like for the sake of um of you know not confusing anyone and being consistent with our reporting requirements we'll continue to report like this to council each month okay anyone else <laughs> thank you very much thank you okay uh we come to appointments to the kerrville charter review commission <laughs> ms brown would you present that <clears throat> 
Yes, sir. In on November twenty seventh, you uh, approved the charge council charge two and schedule for the charter review commission. It's uh, supposed to be a seven member board, and I have thirteen applications, and I put uh, hard copies at most of your places for tonight. And we had two late applications, one from Mr. Garcia and one from Mr. Richards, but I have included those in, in the hard copies that I gave you. So uh, I will get, turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Let me say that uh, in this case and in these other boards that we're going to do appointments on tonight, we have more people applying than, than, than can uh, serve given the number of people for each of those boards. So there are some good people and good applicants that are not, you know, not going to be named to the boards, but um, I hope that we do a good job of, of getting uh, some really good folks on these. And I would, I would like for, uh, for the seven people to serve on the Charter Review Commission, uh, could I have a motion in regard to that? Mayor, Mayor. I, have a, I have a couple of speakers for this item. Okay. Um, the first one is Mario Garcia. Okay. I've got something to say after everyone speaks, Mayor. Do what? I've got something to say after everyone speaks. I just want to run okay. something by the council. <coughs> All right. Good evening. Coming up here every time, it's very humbling. Um, I could have stood here all night. The gentleman that talked about the trees, I played on those trees. That's my grandparents' lot. My son knows that every time we go to HEB, I point out the corners of their area and where the house was and everything. And they mentioned the trail in Shriner, and I used to take, I used to go through that dry creek all the time, walking through here. This whole thing, you understand, is that this is where I'm from. This is who I am. I, I think we all can probably share that title, too. But this is where I'm from. This is where I was raised. This is who I am. And, you know, having a son who's interested in government is kind of really pushing me to think, you know, I have not participated. I have not put the energy into um, being a part of my community. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I had a meeting with you and Mr. McDaniel about Kalia Curtin last week, and I appreciate that. And, um, um, and you got to understand that I was raised here, and so I really didn't have a father figure around. So I looked at all the fathers that are around. And so if a guy that doesn't have a father, what he does is he watches everybody else's father, and he picks up little things. And so when I have the meeting, what I have is to tell you that I want, I'm doing for my son what I wish my father would have done for me. And so in that sense, I feel like I need to be involved more. And I'm asking that you consider me for the charter review. Why not? This is the constitution of our, of our city. And um, I'd really be honored if you would uh, appoint from the floor me to uh, do my duty and to uh, be and basically do what, be a part more of this community than I have been, and then also to, um, you know, I always tell my kids that, you know, we all, we all tell our kids to take risks, do all this kind of stuff, but how many of us do that, right? I mean, we, don't be afraid, don't be scared, do it, and yet, at the same time, how many of us do that? And so I'm actually, when they say you got to move your tree, you know, I, I, we have a saying in my family that I need to move my tree because they're going to drop off of my tree. I better make sure I'm in good soil and good sunlight and good rain, and so... I'm asking that you consider me for the uh, charter review for the commission, and thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. I have another speaker that signed up, Mr. Uh, Clinton Thomas Jr. Okay. <coughs> thank you once more. You know, I'm I'm new at coming to the city council meetings, and I'm just trying to learn everything I can. And one day would love to be on one of the boards, but tonight I'm just was just seeing Mr. Garcia and his son, and it was, I was really moved because of what he is trying to do. So all I'm saying is I'm trying to second his request that if he's qualified, <laughs> that you might consider Mr. Garcia. Uh, Thank right, you. Okay, cool. Mr. Thomas, sometime look at an app on one of our applications at the city secretary's office about you know about one of the committees and boards for yourself. <coughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Thank okay. You. All right. And if he fills one out, Mario, you got to be here to plug <laughs> it, right? Okay. Uh, Mr. Bokel. Uh, I was just the process of making these appointments. I would like to see us all appoint one person and then appoint the other two as a majority, kind of like I stated at the last 
the last time we had this discussion. Kind of follows what we did with the comprehensive plan and it ensures yeah. that we have a diverse group and we're not having a a group uh, that's kind of one sided. Okay. The uh, then I would say, well, it, it, then do you want do you want to make uh, nominations? I'll make an appointment. Well, each place makes an appointment, and then oh oh no 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 we're gonna we're gonna vote as a, as a council. Yeah. Uh, why is that? Why wouldn't you not want to do it my way? Uh, that that's best. I mean, because we're voting as a body. We did the same thing with the comprehensive plan. So if he nominated one, and then I nominated one, and you nominated one, and somebody think, made a motion to, to I think, vote. I those think we five. get it. We get them out to get the somebody give us seven names and let's see where uh, we I'm go. I'm I, I like Peggy McKay on there. I'm okay. prepared to. Right. I'm prepared with this slate. Peggy McKay is on the list of, that I have here. Okay. If, uh, so I would like to make a motion to nominate these seven, and I would also like to say there were lots of good people on there. So uh, we have a second. We'll need a second. Okay. Oh, wait, we have I, a second. I, need, I need to, I'm sorry, I need to clear a motion. I don't know who the, I need the to The motion know who is to nominate, to nominate mm -hmm. seven people, people, but we don't have a second. Well, okay. Well, wait, well, tell, tell, I need to tell name, name tell everybody them. and then we'll Before you make your motion. Yeah. Can, can we discuss then a little bit about, before you create your slate, can we discuss, like he, he was going to talk about Peggy McKay. I actually came prepared to, I was going to nominate Mario. So basically, um, I mean, I, we can talk about all of them, but um, to not discuss any of them, just go with your slate seems a little no, no, less no, like. No, we don't have to do that. I mean, Why she, don't we all have um, a nomination of our own? And, and vote that at that moment on that name. Because if you get, I mean, my, mine may match yours five to seven, but it wouldn't be the complete seven. I'm, 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 I'm suggesting the nomination of Mario Garcia. Okay, so, so why don't we vote on that work now. that into what you've got as a slate. Okay, so you want to vote on each individual who's nominated. Well, if, he, if he's suggesting Peggy McKay, she's already on her list, so... If, if there's a way for you to look at your slate and... Well, I would just like to say, okay, I agree. I would I would agree with uh, nominating Peggy McKay. In other words... Okay. Rather so, than... We'll, we'll go down the line and see who we nominate. You nominate Peggy McKay. Well, George did, and I... Well, okay. You're going to ask for... Vincent did. I'm ready. sorry. Okay, that Vincent, side did. Vincent did. All right. So, you want to nominate somebody else? I'll nominate Brenda Craig. Wait, I'm... I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> are we doing one at a time? We're discussing we something. Yeah. You don't have to write anything down. Because anymore. you're making motions, so I no, need to. No, I we're just to we're just making a motion. We're just okay. we're making a motion. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Uh, then you did say make a we have Peggy and Brenda yeah. and Mario. Okay. Okay. So are we voting on Mario? No, we're just trying to make the seven slate. I thought. Okay. When yeah. We're okay. comfortable with. All of us but we're going to have to yeah. vote on them individually. You're going to have to, because yeah. otherwise yeah. I might not agree with the whole yeah. motion okay. for seven. Uh, Peggy, Brenda, Craig, um, Mario. I'm, Mario. And now I'm going with, yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. You. And, and uh, so Peggy, Brenda, you nominated Mario? Correct. Okay. Uh, I'm going to nominate uh, Karen Yannis. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see Mike Sigerman. Okay, Mike Sigerman. All right. We'll go back to uh, place one. What, for, uh, for another one? Another one. Uh, Alan Cohn. Okay. Okay, I don't, I don't really have a second. I'm just I'm just looking to pick one and join the team on the other two. All right, all right. I'm I'm going to suggest Stephen Fine. I'm missing one. I'm, I'm missing one or two. That makes seven. seven. That makes seven. Two. I mean, how many That's do we have? Seven. That makes seven. So if, if okay, so let's let's <laughs> vote on these individually. All in favor of Peggy McKay, raise hand. I, I would, I think we can go ahead and...
I mean, no. at that point, no? Okay. No. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Peggy McKay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Brenda Craig. Yeah. Brenda Craig. We're doing this all right? I'm You're looking at wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Are you all now going one by one? one. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah. I thought that's what we were going to do from the very beginning. Yeah. That was the idea. But then Each person nominates somebody. As long as y'all are clear and, and uh, city secretary is clear, yeah. I'm okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so did you get that one down? Peggy McKay. We just voted Peggy McKay, McKay on. Get okay. Animus. Brenda, but, but Brenda my, correct. My question is. Who made a motion? Or, I need a motion and a second. Okay. okay. And I'm, I'm going to appoint Peggy McKay to the. Okay. 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 Um, I'll, I'll second that. Charter okay. Okay. Um, and, and then the vote was five to zero. You, you nom okay, would you make a motion, Brenda Craig? I'll make a motion to nominate Brenda Craig, yes. Okay. And who made the motion on Mario? Well, that's well no, we, we need to second. second. I'll, se I'll second Brenda. You okay, you're going to second Brenda. Um, okay, Mario? All in favor? No, no, we all, we're going to vote on Brenda. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. We've got one motion at a time. No. Yeah, we're okay. Is that what you want us to do? One motion at a time per person. I don't want y'all to follow. Just, what, what all right, we okay. Want to the okay. rules, which is either, um, either okay. correct let's, motion let's or take you need the, a nomination. Let's take the motion on uh, Peggy McKay. Do we have a second? We already did that. We did that. Did that. Yeah. yeah, we're on Brenda so now. Peggy's in. Peggy's in. We're on Brenda. Brenda Craig is in. We need a vote Three, on Brenda. Two. Yeah, we need a vote on Brenda. All right. All, okay. all in. Do we have a second? Yes, a yes. second. All in favor of Brenda? Okay. 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 Uh, okay Mario we, Garcia, do we have a second? I, I make a motion that we uh, place Mario Garcia on the. I'll Charlie second. Review. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Let it be known by the raised hands. All right. Motion fails. Okay. Uh, Opposed. Kieran Giannis, um, I make that motion. I'll Please. second. Okay. Second. Uh, all right. All in favor of Karen Giannis? Raise hand. Okay. Um, Did you get the vote? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mike. Okay. Mike Siegerman. I'll make a motion. You made the motion. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor of Mike Siegerman? It passes 3 2. All opposed. Alan Cohn. All opposed, but I, I would okay. like to say on that that it's not anything about no, it's him. Against, it yeah, has to do with, I think it's a bad idea to have a councilman and a charter review committee yeah. married couple. But okay. that's why that vote is the way it is. Um, okay. He's Alan Cohn, um, do I'll we have a motion? motion? I'll make a motion to point out. Do we have a Cone? second? So I'll second it. Okay. Okay. All in favor of Alan Cohn, if you'd let me know by the raised hand. Okay. All opposed. Uh, two, three. Uh, All opposed. Stephen, Stephen Fine. Do you have a second? I'll second. Okay. Is that uh, your motion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I made the motion on Stephen Fine. How many have we appointed? The second. And I second. Yeah, this is second six. Is number six. Yes. Okay. If he's voted in, okay. this is number six. All in, all in favor of Stephen Fine, let me know by the raised hand. Oh, All right. Uh, Passes 4-0. Should we try Mario I think again? Was a five, we right? need five. No. no. I, we need. We need. Uh, we need one more. Mario. Uh, already voted on Mario. Who else? I'd like to Who's recommend John Harrison. Yeah. Okay. It's all the nominations. Is there a second for that? I'll second it. All right. Motion second for John need Harrison. One more person. All in favor? Let it be known by the raised John hand. Harrison. And it passes three. Well, two. you need. I think we need okay. one more. Are I thought we did two. Well, he's not asking. He's all opposed. So, yeah. Okay, I so that was three to two. Okay. I just no. have six. No, that's seven. Okay. That's seven. Let me explain who, okay. who they are. Okay, let me, let me tell you who they are. Yeah. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Alan Cohn? No. Peggy? No. I think Alan Cohn was... I like oh. That was a two-three vote. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Not good to me. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Stephen Fine was five to zero. Yep. Peggy McKay was five to zero. Brenda Craig was five to zero. Mario Garcia was two to three. Karen Giannis was five to zero. Mike Sigerman was three to two. John Harrison was three to two. Okay. Still, one, two. Okay. 
So that's three, seven, four, five, that's six. four six. charter review. Count. So I've got that's six. 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 <laughs> so I you think got Bill. Peggy McKay, <coughs> Brenda Craig, Kieran Giannis, Mike Siegerman, Stephen Fine, John Harrison. How many is that? That's six. That's six. six. Okay, I'll make okay. a nomination that we I would like to nominate uh, Greg Richards. All right. Nomination I'll second. For Greg I'll second. Richards. Got a second. All in favor, let it be known by the raised hand, and Mr. Richards is on there. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what George Okay. Is yeah, he did. On the Animal know. Services oh, Board, yes. 9B, if you'll read that in for us. Okay. Hold on. Uh, the City Council approved the interlocal agreement with Kerr County for Animal and Library Services at your meeting on October 23rd. Uh, this, the agreement affirms that the City may appoint one out of five of the newly created Animal Services Advisory Committee, adopted by Court Order 37057. And I have five applications um, from Tammy Bauman, Karen Guerrero, Randall Johnson, Arthur Modling and Jennifer Sargent. All right. I'd like to make a motion, Mayor, that we appoint Karen Guerrero to a okay. I second that motion, Karen Guerrero, to serve on the Animal Services Advisory I Board. She's, I know she's very involved. I've talked to her. She's very uh, committed to this, and I think she's a great pick. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, I, th that's okay. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> any, any, anything else? Can I nominate somebody else? Uh, yes, you can. But, but we need to vote on that, first, don't we? Okay? That's right. All right, we've okay. got a motion to second for Karen Guerrero. Uh, all in favor, if you let it be known by the raised hand. All right. It's uh, four, um, four, one. All in, all opposed well, by the that, same that side. Take, that's, it's done. Yeah. So that's good. Okay. Okay, appointments to the Recovery Community Coalition, and I am pleased with the number and quality of uh, persons who have applied for for this position. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Bokel and Ms. Eichner if you have comments for us after having interviewed the candidates. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Judy. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, good candidates. Good candidates, and just so many of them. And I, we wish we had more room for, for more people. Um, as we're a we're doing this there is one position that we cannot fill and that is the position of a male uh, owning a uh, 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 sober, home. sober home yes we, we did not have anyone uh, to apply for that so that's the one that we we will not be filling that position um, so what we would like to do, first of all, is I make a motion that we reappoint for a second term the following four individuals. Uh, Leanne Fitzpatrick, Laura Goodwin, Sabine Knetzel, Knels, Kenzel, I'm sorry, and Dale Trees. I'll second that. Okay. We've got a motion a second, and these two council persons are the interview team for this uh, <coughs> For this committee, um, the any further discussion on that <coughs> motion to reappoint these four. All right, all in favor of reappointing these four, if you let it be known by the raised hand, it passes unanimously. Okay. Okay. Next. And then uh, we need one person to fill the the a spot of M H D D, and we have an applicant for that. Uh, his name is Ross Robinson, and we would like to make a motion to uh, uh, vote or to um, elect Ross Robinson to the position of MHDD. Okay. He is head of that mental health entity for this area. Uh, we have a second? Yes. I'll second. second. Okay, Mr. Buckle. All right. All in favor of appointing Ross Robinson to the uh, Recovery Coalition Committee. If you let it be known by the raised hand, we pass it unanimously. And then the last, uh, we need one individual, one additional individual uh, that does not fit any particular category, 
And for that position, uh, we would like to nominate Marissa Dodson for that position. Okay. Right. A second. Okay. Got a motion to second. All in favor of that Marissa Dodson going on that uh, committee? Okay. Great. Um, now, folks, we got 13 people to appoint to the Senior Services Advisory Committee. One at a time. Do planning uh, planning. Should we do it one at a time? <laughs> no, well, that, no. That, that is not that is not a lot of fun. Right. Uh, I'll I, I tell you what I will do. Don't we do planning and zoning, Mr. Next? Mayor? You know, yeah. I think uh, as a suggestion, we've got a, a pad here that Cheryl can write on, and just as as y'all call names out, we can put them on the list, and then you can go down this list one by one again if you want to. All if, right. if that helps. Yeah. Let me ask, may I ask another question, and the answer to this may have to be no. We've got 16 good people. This is a brand new committee. Is there any possibility that we could ex enlarge it to 16? Or just have three alternates, and as with PNZ, it fills in. 16 sounds fine to me. That wouldn't bother yeah. me. We can't do it tonight, though. Right, he, he's correct. We, you can That's point 13 now and then come back and expand it and then appoint the other three. Okay. I, mean, I, I would like to recommend that we do that. We've got 16 good people. and then, then that If that's the case, may I recommend that tonight we go with the first 13 on the list? Wait, wait, don't write anything. <laughs> okay. No, don't no, put it back up. We got it out. We're going to write something. I want you to write one name on there, Sylvia Lewis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just put her name on the top, and we can talk about the rest of them. They quit. That was my number one. No, that's fine. Okay. She was on my list, too. Yeah. There's okay. The now, let me, let me run through that, okay, of the first 13, and then we'll look at appointing the other three <coughs> if we decide to do that. But that would mean Linda Abels. You want to write them all down? Yeah. Right on. Well, I don't know. Do you need to write them down, or do you want to write them, Ms. Brown? I, I'm. Oh, I'm you, you can take them from the list. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then oh, I'm going to say them. You don't have to write them. She'll take the first first thirteen. Oh darn! He was so excited okay. about Linda that. Okay. Linda Abels, Misty Blevins, <laughs> Cynthia Bergen, Karen Burkett, Susan Eklund, Marie Jaton, Waverly Jones, I, I can't Christine see them. Feiler, I can't see them. <laughs> Sylvia Lewis, Robert Ogle, <coughs> Nicholas Oprea. Diana Paul, Rebecca Pizor, and then, then that's, that's, that's then we've got three more. Yeah. All right, and our intention is to come back and, and look at make yeah, adding, committee. either make it a 16 person committee or all of us. Okay. Yeah. okay. Sounds great. The crowd, is getting, the crowd is getting tired. I can tell. So we, we need to move on. Okay, so we need we need a yeah, okay. motion uh, and a second. I, I make a motion we take those thirteen. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Is there anyone here that we didn't call? I mean if there is, you actually showed up and you should probably be on the list. No. <laughs> All right. Okay. Or just leave. Yeah. <laughs> both we can bring the both the journalists on this committee. No. Uh, okay. Do I, do I hear a second to that? Those first 13. I'll second it. I second. She seconded it already. Mr. Broody seconded. All in favor by the raise hand. Okay. Now, on PNC, we can go into executive session, but I think we can avoid that. Do we have a motion we about. Can't, we can't PNC? really go in anyway. Well, I'll make a motion that we, as traditionally done, most of the time, uh, when you've had sitting, reapplying board members who in good standing want to continue and have reapplied, I'd make a motion that we nominate Rustin Zuber, thank you, uh, Garrett Harmon, and um, Bob Waller to be reappointed to their, pos their current positions, and um, Bill Morgan would continue to be an alternate. Okay. That would be my I, just, I, just I second have, that. I just have a question because we nominated or we appointed Bill Morgan and Trisha Byram, I believe, and then we had someone step down. Trisha was put on as a regular member, and we moved Bill to the extended to 2020 expiration date. And so when we appointed Jim Brown, he filled in the 19th. Uh, that, that's what was my understanding what we did. Is that yeah. not correct? 
I, I don't know. Um, it is okay. correct, but here's the thing. And, and I, 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 I was going to raise the point, but um, if we're reappointing okay, that's Bill fine. Morgan, then he's getting two more years. So I, I'd go ahead and... Well, there's a motion on the table. Yeah, yeah there's a motion on the table. Motion, I'd, I'd second, yeah. second the motion the on the table is to reappoint the three yeah. to come up for... For um, reappointment. For reappointment, and then Bill Morgan is... And Bill Morgan is... is Three permanent, one off. Yeah, that sounds okay. good. And All right. I second. We got a motion to second. All in favor? Okay. Um, okay. Item, items for future agendas. I'm serious about about an ordinance against cedar tolerance from December through March. We'll find the source and we can handle that. <laughs> or All find the right. remedy for All the right. source. <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyone else? Any, any other items? I have one. Okay. ZBA. Are those expiring? Are they expired? Or? I have to look at the book. Okay. Well, if they're, if it's time for them, we need to put that on the future agenda. ZBA appointments. Oh yeah, ZBA. But okay. that'll come up automatically. Well, yeah. I think it's. I think they're already expired. Expired. Yeah. I don't have okay. enough applications. Okay. okay. So That's we need more applications for ZBA. Yes. That's what you're saying. Okay. It's on the website. Is there anybody here that's on that senior advisory committee that's here present? I had something for them if they were here, but I think so. But, okay. Well, I had one more, okay. one more future right. agenda item. It's yeah. actually related to that last uh, thing. I, I guess I guess it's a, a question or a consideration that council might have that we do not put, um, we have term limits on a lot of boards, but apparently we don't for P and Z, if I'm correct. No, they have three. No, they can it's serve three, three consecutive yeah. terms. Three consecutive. Oh, okay. All right. Then that, that takes that one off. Um, the other one is one that we're going to be discussing, I assume, next meeting, which is something about um, agenda items being brought up with two councilmen. As yeah. part of that discussion, I'd like us also to be um, talking about getting council the agenda packet detail a little sooner than than Friday, than Friday I if can, I can agree for a lot that. of this stuff that we that we look at. So, anyways, that's a future uh, agenda item as well. Okay, thank you for your attendance, and at eight fifty four we are adjourned.